call the petitions, the cases. Your Honours, good afternoon. This is a continuation of the oral arguments for the 37 consolidated petitions that challenge the constitutionality of Republic Act 11479, otherwise known as the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, or the ATA. May I request the representing councils to make your respective appearances? Anselmo I. Cadiz, representing Petitioner Integrated Bar of the Philippines and its Board of Governors in GR 253124, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Respectfully appearing, Your Honor, is in GR number 252741, Attorney Jose Manuel Diok. Now we are ready, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. I am Attorney Alfredo Molo III, respectfully appearing for petitioners, retired Justices Carpio and Carpio Morales, UP Law Professors et al. In GR number 252736, we are ready, Your Honors. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Evelyn Ursua, respectfully appearing for the petitioners NUJP et al in GR number 252747. You're ready, Your Honor. Your Honors, Edsel Legman, same appearance in GR number 252579. Your Honors, magandang hapon. Neri Javier Colmenares, Counsel for Petitioner in GR 252-585, Your Honors. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Your Honors. I am Attorney Algamar Latif. I am appearing for GR number 252759. We are ready, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. <clears throat> Respectfully appearing as counsel for respondents, ASG Marisa de la Cruz Galandines, ASG Rex Bernardo Pascual, ASG Raymond Rigodon, State Solicitor Eduardo Pocus Jr., Associate Solicitor Kyle Brian Guerrero, and yours truly, Solicitor General Jose Calida, Your Honors. Yes, thank you. Is your raising your right hand, Tony Molo? Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, your Honors, with your indulgence, I have been asked by my clients to make a very quick manifestation, Your Honor. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Your Honors. Your Honors, Last hearing, we heard our kind, learned friend, the Solicitor General, make a more oral manifestation. And in his oral manifestation, he used the following words, and I quote, the Honorable Justice, referring to Honorable Justice Leonen, even hinted that maybe the Aita case would provide an actual controversy to warrant this Honorable Court's exercise of its power of judicial review, end quote. The Solicitor General went on to state that the filing of a petition for intervention by a certain party was, and I quote, made in a desperate attempt to establish 
actual justiciable controversy in these consolidated petitions, end quote. With all due respect, your honors, the statement is unkind and inaccurate. Our learned friend used an overbroad and sweeping characterization of all 37 petitions. And we have just five quick items to manifest. First, the esteemed Solicitor General may have misread the pertinent allegations in the petitions, including that of petitioners Justice Carpio and Justice Carpio Morales, establishing the elements of justiciability and compliance thereto. To begin with, legal standing has many forms and actual case or controversy in constitutional law is not the same as pending case, but we will expound in our memorandum, Your Honor. Are you second, true? Are you true? Uh, just a few more, Your Honor. Um, second, the premises of petitioner Justice Carpio for the facial challenge are matters of record and uncontested. Besides, questions during oral arguments are meant to explore and test a position and therefore, with all due respect, it is premature and improper to even allude that those questions indicate prejudgment or that a justice has validated one's legal position. And finally, Your Honor, we would like to believe, of course, that the statements were unintentional, but we make this manifestation to clear the air and hopefully prevent further confusion. That is all, Your Honor. You may include that in your memorandum. Yes, Your Honor, we will also file. Let me just, let me just note your manifestation. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Pop. Okay, we will now proceed with the interpolation. May I be allowed to first uh, put it the one for some questions? I request uh, Dean uh, Jokno, Attorney Jokno. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dean. No? Good afternoon, ma'am. I just yes, want to ask some clarificatory questions because of the questions and your answers for the past two hearings. No? I'm referring to the first uh, three enumerations in Section 4, uh, letters A, B, and C. Yes, sir. You are, uh, I, if I got you right, you have uh, some questions as to whether or not this one is vague, okay. but you do not have any questions as far as uh, paragraphs D and E. Okay. Now, letter A provides that engages in acts intended to cause death. No, I think uh, you have an objection on this because you are punishing the intent. Did I get you right? It well, is the intent that's being punished. Unlike, uh, if Your Honor, please, the Human Security Act, which clearly penalized uh, predicate crimes, yeah. the no. definition in the Anti-Terror Act, Your Honor, replaced the predicate crime requirement with yeah. acts intended to cause uh, death, etc. Yeah. But if you follow the definition in the Human Security Act, which is now amended by this law, then it would seem that patayan uh, muna. <coughs> Bago terrorist terrorism, because in the enumerations under the old law, there are several predicate crimes, no? And the predicates listed are kidnapping for ransom, uh, even robbery, highway robbery, even murder, and so on. So it would seem from your definition that there must still there must be uh, these predicate crimes should first be committed before they could be liable for terrorism. Uh, if I may, Your Honor, please, under the Human Security Act, uh, Book 1 of the Revised Penal Code is expressly incorporated, which means that even attempts and frustrated stage of the commission of the crime are punished under the old law. However, under the Anti-Terror Act, uh, that phrase is included in the definition regardless of the stage of execution, so it appears to do away with yeah. the stages of but, execution, Your Honor. But uh, do you find any crimes in the revised penal code that uh, penalize preparatory acts? Because it would seem that paragraphs A, B, and C refer to preparatory acts. That's why in the law says they are disregarding the stages of felony under the revised penal code. And this simply means 
that this A, B, and C are preparatory acts. Do you agree with me? Well, Your Honor, the, the Human Security Act penalizes from the no, no, I'm, I'm referring. Forward. I'm referring to the present law now. With respect the, the, way, the, way, the way I understand from the provisions in A, B, and C engages in acts intended to cause. No? These are preparatory acts. And there is a provision in the law that this law will not follow the stages of felony, regardless of the stages of felony in the revised penal code. So, so that means that these are preparatory acts. Because if you use the stages of felony under the revised penal code as a rule, then the cri then criminal responsibility will begin from attempted felony. But these provisions engages acts intended to cause, they have not yet reached the attempted stage. These are preparatory acts. Do, is, do you agree with me? Yes, Your Honor, that okay. is precisely okay. one of our concerns yeah. with okay. the okay. law. So you agree with me? Now, my next question is, are there provisions in the law where preparatory acts are punished? Your Honor is referring to the anti-terror law or more no, no. generally? I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just asking you, are there existing crimes that are punished even if the acts are still preparatory and therefore they have not yet reached the attempted stage? Are there crimes? Well, I would only be aware, Your Honor, of crimes that penalize conspiracy. Yeah. So. Proposal to commit a crime of rebellion, that is a crime. Yes, sir. Okay. When we speak of proposal, it is merely a proposal to commit a crime of rebellion. That's all. Yes, sir. There is no yet act, overt act, that will, that will show an attempted act of rebellion. Because merely proposal, that is Spanish, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. If the proposal is accepted, then it becomes conspiracy because conspiracy is an agreement of two or more persons, right? That's right. Yeah. And these are also preparatory acts. Yes, sir. Yes. There is also a crime of proposal to commit the crime of sedition. I mean, conspiracy to commit the crime of sedition. Yes, there is a yes. crime. Yes, sir. Yes. But there is no proposal to commit the crime of sedition. Yeah. There is also a crime of inciting to rebellion. Is it not? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, these are preparatory acts. I would consider inciting, Your Honor, as a act that um, is consummated upon uh, the speech being made by the person. So yeah, but there is... I yeah, would but, not consider yeah, but it when you a, commit, Yeah, but when you commit the crime of sedition, there must be tumultus apreye. So when I incite somebody, there is no yet tumult. Eh. I'm inviting people eh, to be along more or more, more than four persons. Eh. Diba? commit violence eh, and achieve the purposes of sedition. Eh. That is inciting to sedition because if there is already tumultuous apre, and therefore there is already prevention of the execution of a duty that is performed by, by an agency, government agency, that's already consummated. Eh. In so far as sedition is concerned, inciting then uh, could yes, be a yes, preparatory yes. There, there is a crime of inside, there is a crime of proposal and conspiracy to commit the crime of treason. There is also a crime of proposal and conspiracy to commit the crime of rebellion. There is also a crime of proposal and conspiracy to commit the crime of codeta, which is a new law, inserted only under Article 134 in the crime of rebellion. And there is a crime of conspiracy of sedition. All of these acts are preparatory acts. These are not new. These acts were there since in, in 1932, when the revised penal code was crafted. So, if the anti-terrorism law now provides preparatory acts as crimes, is there therefore, is that, are these provisions now void? The problem, Your Honor, is that the anti-terror law does not employ the terminology of preparatory acts. It simply says acts intended to. And that uh, gives rise now to a whole broad possible yeah, interpretations. Yeah. And that is really our, yeah, you our may be, attack. You may be correct. Law. You may be correct. No? But if you look at Section 4, Section 5, Section 6, Section 7, and Section 8, Section 9, these are the provisions eh, that are covered by paragraphs A, B, and C. Number 5, threat to commit terrorism. Number 6, preparing and facilitating the commission of terrorism. 
conspiracy to commit terrorism, proposal to commit terrorism, inciting to commit terrorism. Precisely, A, B, and C are provided in Section 4 because of the provisions in Section 5, Section 9. So what is, uh, what is vague and what is void under this uh, enumerations under paragraphs A, B, and C. Well, what is vague, Your Honor, is the terminology acts intended to, because that is a state of mind that is left to the law enforcer to determine whether those acts, which are not criminal or violent acts in themselves, can but, give rise to yeah. the inference of yeah. um, intent, Your Honor. Yeah, but uh, if you look at the, the whole text of Section 4, the intention is based from the purpose. Where is the purpose? Well, there's oh, there are separate. purposes under, under paragraph E. The law makes reference, Your Honor, to two states of mind. In the first part, it makes reference to acts intended to. and in the second part, it makes reference to purposes, Your Honor. Now, supposing there are a group of armed men, our government, they are planning uh, to commit terrorist acts as defined in the, the, the terrorism law. So they are planning. They are talking about arming themselves and so on. No? And there is evidence and, and heard that they are planning to attack a, uh, a municipality or a or a, an edifice, a government building, no? to create uh, fear among the population or the population. What will you say? Will that not be preparatory acts? Do we still have to determine what is the intention? It's already very clear from the acts. Eh? Well, so we will not punish the, that kind of a situation. That would clearly fall within the, the crime of proposal, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, suppose it is punished under Section 80. That's what I'm saying. Eh? Yung paragraph 5 to paragraph 9, these are the, the situations where preparatory acts are committed, inciting to commit terrorism. Proposal to commit terrorism. All of these are preparatory acts. So anyway, um, you include in your memorandum your your you know, your your other reasoning on the, this, my questions, Dean. No? Yes, Your Honor. So wait, that, that's all, Dean. That's all, Dean. I just Thank wanted you, to be clarified. Just short questions, lang. Okay. May I request uh, Congressman Lagman? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Congressman. We always see each other in Congress when we present our budget in the judiciary. Okay. Now, just clarificatory questions on Section 29. Yeah. Now, uh, there have been already a lot of questions that uh, the provision in the Constitution of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of Cavius Corpus and that a case should be filed within the three-day period, that provision does not, does not apply under Section 29. No? I think that's the, that's the, uh, those are the questions that were asked during the last, uh, last hearing. No? Now my question is uh, concentrated on Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. Okay. Do you agree with me, Congressman, that Article 125 was introduced as early as 1932. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, the periods to file cases under 125 would be 36 hours for those penalized by afflictive penalties, reclusion perpetua, life imprisonment, and death. 36 hours. Yes. Yeah. And, and for other, for uh, non afflictive crimes, then it is 24 hours. Yes. And for light felonies, then it's a 12 hours. That is correct. Since, the originally yeah, right. Since the introduction of Article 125, this law has never been amended. That is correct. Yeah, it's it has never been amended. It is only in the anti crime and the anti terrorism law where they extended the period to 14 days.
It is, it is only in the anti-terrorism law that uh, they extended the period to 14 days, original period with an extension of 30 days. That's, that's the law. That, that, that's the law now, Mr. Congressman. That is correct, Your Honor. Under the ATA, uh, the period of detention has been extended to 14 days, renewable or extendable for under 10 days, or a maximum of 24 it, yeah. days. Yeah, you are correct there, Congressman. Is it not that the 36 hours provided for in the revised penal code as early as 1932 is no, is, is no longer, should no longer be the period considering the population now? Beg your pardon, Your Honor. Consider. Uh, do you think that the 36 hour period to deliver a person arrested without a warrant to the judicial authorities, that is still a sufficient period? for peace officers to deliver the persons arrested without a warrant? That, that is a mandatory period. Yeah, Otherwise, they will be uh, accountable. Yeah, they will be accountable for arbitrary detention. In excess of the 36 hours, they will be liable under 125 to, for delay in delivery of persons arrested without a warrant. Yes, Your Honor, yeah, but what... under the ATA, under Section yeah. 29, yeah. they could always claim yeah. that they have been authorized by the ATC to detain a person suspected of terrorism yeah. for 14 days and extendable to another 10 days yeah, or correct. a total of 24 yeah. days. My, my, my question, uh, Congressman, you are correct. You quoted the law pro properly. My question is this. Uh, when the 36 hour or the periods provided for in Article 125, this provision was introduced as early as 1932. And probably the population of the country was even less than 1 million. So it was very easy to deliver a person arrested within, uh, arrested without a warrant within the period of 36 hours. Wala pa pa kong traffic nun eh. 36 hours yan eh. Now the experience, no? the experience is that uh, cases are filed hastily before the courts because of this restrictive period of 36 hours. Your Honor, uh, that is still a good law as Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. Yeah. And uh, that is consistent with our uh, undertaking under international convention that any person taken into custody must be promptly delivered yeah, but to the judge or a judicial authority. Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, that's correct, uh, Congressman. My only my only concern is this. No, this law was introduced in 1932, 36 hours. But probably the the uh, population was less than one million during that time. Uh, I think we were not yet born. 1932, yung revised penal code, eh. ba? And less than one million people, no. And then it was very easy to deliver the person arrested without warrant. Because you just go to the court, then deliver the person to the court, and then the court will issue a warrant of arrest. That was the procedure. Eh. But because of development of our laws, and dami ng crimes ngayon. Meron ng dangerous drugs law, meron ng qualified trafficking, meron ng syndicated distapa, meron ng violation ng 1092-62. Congress has enacted a lot of laws. Eh. So my point is, even if there is no there is no 14 day provision, section 20 and ATT, I think that 125 should already be amended because that has never been amended since 1932. Eh. Uh, and you can just imagine a person arrested without a warrant, a murder, a person with What are the what are the requirements that should be filed? Meron uh, meron ano yan? May, meron autopsy, meron uh, witnesses account. If there are evidence or object evidence recovered from the scene of the crime, bullets, they will refer to the ballistic examiner. If the other person is arrested, they will refer him for paraffin examiner. How can they file the case within 36 hours? Uh, they Your cannot probably file the case within 36 hours. Uh, Your Honor, protection of fundamental rights should not be capsulized in the time frame. Such guarantees are immutable, and it should be respected under all regimes and under all eras. Yeah, so, yes, I, I agree with you that, but we are also talking of our experience where cases are hastily 
he filed. You know, if you trace the history of the liberal persons of the judicial authorities, before it was easy to file cases because you just go to the court and then the court will conduct the required preliminary examination and then issue a warrant of arrest. Now it's, now it's, it's different. No. The delivery to the judicial authorities now include the filing of the case before the fiscal's office. Eh? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what they are doing now. And you can just imagine there are so many crimes that are not being committed, drug cases, and then they have to file the case within 36 hours because delivery to a person but to judicial authorities it is interpreted to mean that the case must be filed within the 36 hours. Eh? That's, right. that's the interpretation of delivery to the person arrested without a warrant to the judicial authority. So my only you, my, my point is this. Do you think that the 14-day period for 40-day uh, uh, period for the peace officers or arresting officers to conduct an investigation and eventually to file the cases before the judicial authorities, those who are arrested without a warrant, too long? Your Honor, 14 days, which is extendable to 24 days, I submit would be inordinately long and odious. Yeah, but under no, the- Your Honor, yeah. uh, when the Revised penal when the penal code was enacted way back in 1932. I agree that there were few crimes, but also there were few police officers or agents enforcing the law. But now there are many police officers, countless of them, so that Congress has to appropriate billions of pesos to support the PNP. So I would submit your honor that Article 125 is still a good law. What should be important is not the prolongation of detention, but the efficiency of police and military operatives. Yeah, and also that intelligence should be professional and accurate. Yeah, but there are also other circumstances, not only the number of uh, policemen, but numbers of policemen, but traffic, you know, lack of uh, chemists, lack, lack of examiners, and so on. Anyway, I will, I will, you know, I will, I will leave that uh, sec article one to five. I will go to another point now. My question is, uh, who should grant the extension? Well, uh, under the law, there is no specification as who shall grant the extension but impliedly, the one who issued the original uh, written authorization to detain most probably must be the one to make the extension. You're, you're, you're referring to the ATC? The ATC, Your Honor. Uh, have, have, you the, uh, have you read the implementing rules about the role of the ATC under Section 29? The, the, the implementing rules, Your Honor, cannot rectify an absence in the law. No, it I has think. Congress, it, which, which has the authority to amend, modify, or clarify the law. No, not think. an executive agency making the IRR. Okay, I will not, I will not debate on you on that. that uh, you have your own interpretation. I will not debate on you on that because it's clear from the uh, implementing rules that the uh, interpretation of the role of the ATC is that it's only for purposes that the, the policeman cannot cannot uh, comply with the period with the period required under 125, not the 14 day period, the 125. Then the ATC may. I think that's uh, that's in the in, in the in the in the implementing rules. Not to extend actually, they cannot extend. The peace officers cannot extend. I think that's the role of the ATC. Uh, Your Honor, yeah. may I just uh, say that the IRR means implementing rules and regulation. Yeah. It does not mean implementing rectifying rules and regulations. Okay. <laughs> now, another, another question. It is your theory that the ATC is authorized to uh, warrant, to issue warrants? Did I get you right last time, Congressman? Yes, the personality of the law is written authorization to take a suspected person under custody. Yeah. That means to say, 
a written authorization would also include a warrant of arrest yeah. because you cannot detain someone without accosting or taking him into custody. Yeah, but uh, there are two ways of arresting a person. One is the issuance of a warrant of arrest after filing a case before the court, and the other one is a warrantless arrest. Yes, Your Honor. So but, which, which of the two? Uh, and under Article 27, the title is very obvious. It says, detention without a judicial warrant of arrest. This is a direct infringement of Section 2 of Article 3 of the Bill of Rights, which says that no warrant shall issue except upon probable cause to be personally determined by the judge. In the case of ATA, the judicial warrant is supplanted by an executive warrant which has been deleted as a provision in the 1987 yeah. Constitution, where yeah. it appears in the 1970 that, Constitution. That's why, I, that's why my question is, uh, does this refer to the two kinds of arrest, arrest without a warrant, and, and, and a warrant of arrest issued by the court? Well, in, in this case, Your Honor, Section 27 refers to an arrest and detention without a judicial warrant. The yeah, because, title says so. Because if the intention of Congress was to include a judicial warrant, eh, sa tingin ko, di makakalusot sa Senado yan. Because we have bright people in the Senate. Eh. Your, if, Your Honor, if, if Section 29 is intended to cover judicial warrant where an information must be first filed, then I think I think uh, even 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 in Congress or Senate, you will not allow it. Your Honor, the problem is uh, the bill and the Senate antedated the bill in the House, and the bill in the House was a copycat of the bill in the Senate. So much so there was any more oh. no need for a bicameral oh, conference are, there, committee. There, there, there are uh, bright people in the Senate. Well, uh, that, uh, it, that have uh, it, it, allowed it, it, this kind of provision the way you interpreted it, no? I will not mention their names, no? I thought if uh, this one refers to a judicial warrant because they fully know that under the rules of court, the rules of court provides for the procedure in the issuance of a warrant of arrest. So, a, and a law cannot even, uh, uh, cannot even prevail over a procedure. Of a, of a Supreme Court rules pertaining to practice of law. Eh? That is a procedure required under the rules of procedure. Eh? Kaya sabi ko, I thought if those uh, bright people in the Senate could have allowed it, because I think uh, everybody knows that if it comes to procedure, then we have to defer to the procedure, because uh, that is also recognized in the Constitution. I will go back to the very title of Section 29. It says, detention without a judicial warrant of arrest. Yeah. That means to say, it is an arrest without the issuance of a warrant. Okay, I will give you an example. I will give you an example, Congressman. If there are violators of a, forget about terrorism. If there are violators now, now I'm going, no, there are violators violating a law. I'm the head of the office. I'm a general. Can I not tell my 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 subordinates go and arrest them? It will that be valid or invalid? Well, Your Honor, the the arrest uh, can only be made by a judge issuing the warrant of arrest. So, so However, there are only three exceptions. Uh, in flagrante delicto, uh, hot pursuit, and in the case of a scapee, who is a prisoner yeah. or a detention prisoner. Yeah, that, that's my example. Eh? If there are uh, policemen no, around the area and there are violators, can I not, if I am the head of the the unit cannot I tell my policemen go arrest the violators if the violations are done in the presence under paragraph A and paragraph 3 of rule 113 either a flagranti rule and uh, and hot pursuit rule uh, Can outside, they not do that? outside of the three instances provided uh, for under rule 113 of the rule, uh, section okay. 5 so there could be no legal warrantless okay. arrest so if the head of the office head of the office instructs or orders his subordinates to arrest a person in hot pursuit or in flagrante delicto, that will be okay. That will be okay, okay. Your Honor. 
That is okay. within so we, 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 we do not have debate on that. Okay. So that's all, uh, Congressman. I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank for you. This Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again. I am. I am done. Any, you know, any interpolator? First, and Muna. Okay. Justice Mon Hernando. Thank you very. Thank, thank you very you, much. Chief. Just two or three questions. Uh, by way of continuation of my questions last last week, may I please call on Congressman Colmenares? to answer my questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Congressman. Good Paul afternoon, Paul. It's all right to ask you about Section 4 of the ATA? Yes. Uh... You, you can ask me of that, All right. even if the clusters yes. are different. I, I recall someone uh, amongst you mentioning that what Section 4 penalizes is mere intent. Yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been discussed by Attorney Jokno, but we also support that uh, contention, Your Honor, please. Yes. If you would read Section 4, It would appear, at least to me at this time, that it's just, it's just not intent that is penalized. There has to be an act. Correct, Your Honor. Because, uh, for instance, in Section 4A, it says, engages in acts yes, intended to. Okay. So that should not mean that the law punishes intent in itself. I think, Your Honor, what we are asserting is this. The definition says any act could be a legal act. It could be an illegal act. It depends. The fact that it can encompass an illegal act does not cure the fact that it can also encompass a legal act. So in this case, Your Honor, we are saying that we are committing a legal act. It's not illegal. But because of the imputation of the uh, intention, and the purpose, then it becomes terrorism. As an example, Your Honor, please. I call for a huge rally. The huge rally paralyzed traffic. And then our demand was that the president should step down from Malacanang. The ATC files a case against me because I committed an act which seriously interferes with the critical infrastructure, which is transportation. And the purpose is intimidation or influenced by intimidation the government. That is terrorism for the, under this law. We contend, Your Honor, that it was an exercise of our constitutional right. If they want to charge us with something else like, well, you have no permit, etc., well and good, we can discuss it in court. The problem with this, Your Honor, is that the example that it can be used to an actual terrorist also ensures that it can also be used on actual dissenters. And of course, Your Honors, uh, I think it's the unbridled discretion to select who the target is that is a problem in the law, Your Honor. And the Supreme Court has invalidated so many laws, Your Honor, but, on the basis uh, of unbridled me. discretion. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Uh, but don't you think that the proviso in Section 4 would address that? Uh, I'm referring to the proviso that terrorism, as defined in this section, shall not include advocacy, dissent, etc. Yes, actually, it's the, re the impact is the reverse, Your Honor. Because now that they included this, actually what Section 4 is, advocacy and the exercise of civil political rights is included in terrorism if it is intended to uh, cause physical harm. So without, I don't know if the Congress intended this, but they actually admitted in the law that the exercise of civil and political rights can become a terrorist act. So instead of a safeguard, Your Honor, they expressly included that. Imagine, Your Honor, you know, as I mentioned a while ago, I, was I don't think it, it should be construed that, that way because the proviso uses the word not, no? so it's exclusive, not inclusive. Yes, but it also shall is. not include. Yes, you're, you're correct, Your Honor. But it also added something else, provided it is not intended to cause. 
if they ended with period, it is not included. That's it. But, but I won't think... you think also that that goes without saying? Because even if uh, it's not included, uh, the phrase which are not intended, then a law enforcer could still arrest people if the rally would turn into a murderous rampage no? Your by Honor, the rioters. Your Honors, please. I was describing EDSA a while ago, actually. Under this law, EDSA is a terrorist act because it, it goes into the vague and amorphous intent to seriously interfere with critical infrastructure. So, Your Honors, please, I couldn't think of an exercise of constitutional right that can become terrorism to be addressed by this law that is not actually punished by other laws like the Human Security Act. The Human Security Act, Your Honor, I could not think even of any terrorist act that cannot be punished by the Human Security Act, draconian though it may be, or the revised penal code, Your Honor. So what's the purpose of including this safeguard? And for us, Your Honor, we allege, we allege that the purpose is to actually include dissent and chill people from dissenting because the moment you exercise your civil and political rights, we can impute intention of harm to you and you can be charged, no, not charged, Your Honor. You can be detained for 24 days, which is a punishment in itself, Your Honor. Well, so, uh, as I said, and I'm pointing out again to how the proviso is is crafted. Yes, it says right. shall not, no? So, so that's a warning to a law enforcer that he yes, should not right. interfere with the uh, uh, group's uh, advocacy or dissent, etc. except when the law enforcer would see that the act transitions into something more sinister, like already setting on fire the houses, killing people, etc., etc. That That is, you are correct. In that, that's that sense, another way of looking at it, isn't it? it uh, yes, Your Honor. But the fact that it can be used uh, against you. people setting fires, and it, but it can also be used against people not setting fires, that's the problem with this law, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. The HSA anyway covers those acts okay. anyway, in your honor's case. Okay, thank you, Congressman. Now, uh, I seem also to recall that one of you said that Section 4, as worded, would reverse the burden of proof uh, in respect of a person charged because he would have to overturn, or I mean to overcome, uh, the intent that the law would attribute to him. Yes, is that uh, accurate? I was not the one who said that, Your Honor, but we can support that too. In the example mm -hmm. I just gave to you, the big rally, paralyzed traffic for four So days. if somebody is arrested under Section 4, it would be his turn at, the, at inception to present evidence that it was not his intention to commit the I, I don't uh, think his, that was... Crimes. I don't think that was the essence of what was stated by my colleagues. It is probably in the sense that because of the paralysis and the imputation that it was intended to strictly interfere with critical infrastructure, it is now my burden to prove that, no, 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 when we held that rally, it paralyzed traffic for four days like EDSA, but we did not intend to, you know, to but, commit but terrorist That acts. is not what will happen in court. Uh, Congressman Colmenares. Yes, you're right. Because you're uh, if a person is arrested under this act and charged with a violation of Section 4, it will be the prosecution at inception that will, by the evidence that it will introduce, establish the act plus the purpose. Isn't it? Yes, you're right. Because the constitutional presumption of innocence is maintained. Section 4 could, cannot possibly override uh, the constitutional presumption of innocence. We, so, uh, by the rules of evidence, it will always be the prosecution that will introduce evidence that will show the act yes, defined right. and punished in Section 4 plus the purpose. Yes, and right. only then will the accused be able to show his evidence that it was not his intention to commit the, the crime imputed to him. Uh, the section four, isn't it? Yes, Your Honor. We contend, okay. however, that uh, right. it violates the presumption of innocence. In fact, can be a re, a re, you, 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 you but, but as I said, the yes, Constitution reigns supreme. Yes, Your Honor. So, ATA obviously cannot stand 
on a better footing than the Constitution. Okay. Uh, is it also all right to ask you about Section 29 of the yes. Act? Congressman Edsel Lagman, Your Honor, I will probably answer it uh, generally, but Congressman Lagman is the one in charge of the cluster, Your Honor's please. So if I uh, thank you, thank you, Paul. thank you, Paul. if I may ask Congressman uh, Lagman, uh, just two or more questions, Chief, and then I finish. Good afternoon, uh, Congressman Latman. Good afternoon, Mr. Justice. Uh, I, I've been reading Section 29 uh, probably about 30 times already. No? And I, I find something peculiar about this provision that, that's... Uh, which is not found in any other law. Okay. The second paragraph says, immediately after taking custody of a person suspected of committing a crime, uh, terrorism, etc., the law enforcement agent or military personnel shall notify in writing the judge of the court nearest the place of apprehension. And then this uh, written uh, notice should also be furnished the ATC and significantly, very significantly, the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, I don't find this kind of a requirement even under the Dangerous Drugs Act. No? Your Honor. Or any other penal code, w would you venture to uh, your opinion as to why there is this provision of well, written notice to the judge and then CHR and ATC? Your Honor, it's supposed to be a safeguard. But that safeguard is illusory because that written notice is not even required to be under oath. So the police officer can fabricate his account and he will not be held accountable. Unlike in the Human Security Act, when the requirement is that before detaining a person under the Human Security Act, the police officer or law enforcer shall bring personally such person to the nearest judge so that the latter can verify the identities of the law enforcer and the suspect, de determine why the suspect has been apprehended, and most importantly, to find out whether the suspect has been subjected to torture. That safeguard has been deleted and has and that does not appear in the 88 year honor. Mm -hmm. So it's a safeguard, but uh, something that is you think illusory. Yes, your honor. Mm -hmm. If the police just like the other safeguards provided for in the human. Uh, in the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. Uh, we will uh, further amplify that in our memorandum, Your Honor. Uh, Section 29 also says that if the police uh, officer or official who does not comply with the requirements in Section 29, or who will not comply with the requirements in Section 29, then he shall be charged with uh, violating this provision. And what looms over him is a 10 year imprisonment, no? That's quite heavy. Yes, Your Honor, uh, that is uh, true, but the damage has been done 
to the suspects civil liberties mm -hmm. and that period of uh, imprisonment for the errant police officer or law enforcer will not be sufficient to compensate the infringement of political of civil and fundamental rights now may i just clarify what you answered earlier on a question uh, posed to you by by the chief justice uh, this is with regard to the extension of uh, the detention to 10 days yes your honor you said that it's actually the law enforcer who shall determine whether or not to extend i i didn't say that your honor but what i was asked who shall make or grant the extension. Mm -hmm. And I said, the law does not say who shall be the authority. But I would presume that since the written authorization for detention without a judicial warrant was made by the Anti-Terrorism Council, that the Anti-Terrorism Council must be the one to make such extension. All and right. the law provides for a number for a three conditions for the extension. I, I would submit, Your Honor, that 14 days is too long for a detention if only police officers would be mindful of their job as uh, agents of the state. And uh, to my mind, Your Honor, uh, that 14 days, which is even too long already, should not anymore be extended. Mm -hmm. Because, but, but don't you think uh, Section 29 recognizes the, 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 the very delicate nature of, uh, of uh, God, God, evidence gathering in respect of terrorism? As you know, it's a global threat to yes, Your Honor. humanity, no? and our law enforcers would have to uh, coordinate with the Interpol, they would have to coordinate with the FBI, and with all other investigative agencies of uh, other countries in order that they can fortify uh, terrorism cases against, uh, again, in our local jurisdiction. No? But, but anyway, hey, your, uh, your Honor. my that... reading of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Lagman, my reading of section 29 is that the arresting officers or the authorities would have to deliver the person arrested within 14 days no, to the judicial authorities. And the need for extension will only be made upon delivery. If let's say they deliver the arrested person on the 14th day, they cannot by themselves, even the ATC, this is my opinion, no? it, the, that even the ATC can decide to extend the detention. They would have to deliver already the person to the judicial, to the ju judicial authorities. And the extension, they will have to ask from the court. Uh, at least that's my reading of section 29. And with regard to to the three, uh, Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, the period uh, uh, mentioned there of 36 hours, uh, as you know, when there is rebellion or insurrection and there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, the period would be three days. No? And from my reading of uh, the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission on that provision in the Constitution, the commissioners intended that the three-day period shall apply only to rebellion or insurrection and when there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. In other words, it is left to Congress as a policy matter to determine another period for another kind of offense. And this would be terrorism because of the special nature of the crime. It would need a longer period for law enforcement to gather evidence and to detain people. My, my, <clears throat> my understanding, Your Honor, is that the three-day period when, when uh, the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, 
will cover not only the crime of rebellion or crimes related to invasion, but it would cover all crimes. It is... Uh, uh, but that is not what the Constitution provides, uh, Congressman. The Constitution does not provide yeah. that it should only cover the, the crimes of rebellion and acts related to invasion. The expresso unius es exclusio arterius. No? Yeah, we cannot possibly include other crimes not mentioned in the Constitution. The, the, the section uh, 18 of Article uh, uh, 7 does not enumerate any crime. So it would cover all crimes, Your Honor. No, and it, that it, was also the submission of uh, Commissioner Padilla in the proceedings before the Constitutional Commission. That it should not only be limited to uh, rebellion or crimes related to invasion, but must cover all crimes. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think it's the other way around, his uh, position on that. Well, that uh, it shall cover only rebellion and insurrection and only when there is suspension of the read. Uh, of I, I have just read the proceedings, Your Honor, this afternoon. Okay. And that was my reading of the statement of uh, Commissioner Padilla. We will amplify this, Your Honor, in our memorandum. But let me also right. say, Your Honor. Uh, it, it's all right, uh, Congressman. No. I've been enlightened enough. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. But uh, may, I, may I please the court, Your Honor, and Your Honor, that uh, with respect to the 14-day period, it does not say that the 14-day period should be the terminal for uh, delivering the suspect to the judicial authority. As a matter of fact, the prolongation is extended, the detention is extended, and the delivery to the judicial authority would be after the expiration of the extended period of 24 days. We respectfully submit your honor, and we are going to explain that in our memorandum. All right. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no more questions, uh, Chief. Thank you. Justice Kagiwa is next. Thank you, Chief. Um, can I call attorney Ursua? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. I want to begin with certain historical antecedents of this anti-terror law, and I will be asking you to confirm this. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The Philippines, as a member of the international community, particularly as a member state of the United Nations, has certain obligations in order to, in order to maintain its good standing, correct? Yes, Your Honor. In particular, Article 25, Chapter 5 of the UN Charter states, and I quote, the members of the United Nations agree to, and accept, agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter, close quote. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. One of these decisions is found in United Nations Security Council Resolution 2178, unanimously adopted by the UNSC on September 24, 2014, and I quote, to prevent and suppress recruiting, organizing, transporting, or equipping, semicolon, prevent, prevent and suppress financing, semicolon, and prevent travel, close quote, of foreign terrorist fighters, or what they call FTFs, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Also, in UNSC Resolution 2396, member states are urged, again, I quote, to strengthen their efforts to stem the threat posed by FTFs through measures on border control, criminal justice, and information sharing and counterterrorism. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, the overriding objective of these resolutions is to stop the increase of foreign terrorist fighters or FTFs, including their expansion in recruitment, and their material support other than financing. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Right. 
these international obligations in effect acknowledge that terrorism is a global reality that transcends borders and requires the cooperation of all states, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And the Philippines, being a member of the UN, must play its role in the overall effort to curb this problem, correct? Yes, Your Honor. It's not merely a domestic issue, but an international one, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So we can agree that this objective or state policy is not only laudable, but in fact, essential. That is correct, Your Honor. The Philippines is also a member of the Asia Pacific Group on money laundering, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that is um, an intergovernmental organization that aims to implement and enforce internationally accepted standards to address money laundering, terrorist financing, particularly the Financial Action Task Force recommendations, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And one of the rules of membership in the APG, I will call it APG, is to submit to a mutual peer review system to assess compliance with international money laundering and counterterrorism financing. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. This peer review system is also referred to as mutual evaluations, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. In 2008, in the second round ME of the Philippines, do you know what happened? Uh, no, Your Honor. The Philippines received a poor rating in, in the 2009 ME report due to major shortcomings in the anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism legal framework. As a result, the Philippines was placed in the FATF's gray list and subjected to the International Cooperation Review Group process in 2010. What is this gray list, do you know? Uh, countries that are deemed uh, not sufficiently compliant, Your Honor, with these obligations to address money laundering. And being in the gray list will affect the country's credit rating in the international community, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And in fact, it will prevent the Philippines from even receiving an A credit rating, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the highest credit rating, as far as you know, is what? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Triple A? For the United States, for example. Is that a triple A country credit I think rating? So, Your Honor. And we, we are not there. We are just in category BBB, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So, so we have, if we are in the gray list, we cannot, as a country, become A. We cannot move from triple B to A, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. In response, historically, and I want you to confirm this, the Philippines enacted several laws to facilitate its removal from the gray list, correct? Yes, Your Honor. We're talking about Republic Act 10167 and Republic Act 10168. Yes, These Your are Honor. laws that strengthen the anti-money laundering law, granting the AML, AMLC the authority to inquire into bank deposits without the consent of the owner, but upon order of a court. That is correct, Your Honor. And RA 10168, which penalized the crime of terrorist financing, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The following year, on February 15, 2013, another law was passed, RA 10365, that introduced amendments to the 2001 Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2001. And it included other, it expanded covered persons to include foreign exchange corporations, money changers, pre-need and insurance companies, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the predicate crimes listed here expanded, was expanded from the original 14 to 34. That's correct, Your Honor. Finally, in 2013, the Philippines was removed from the gray list, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Following these legislative reforms of the Republic Acts I just mentioned, the, FA, the FATF removed the Philippines from the gray list, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But there were still concerns about the lack of coverage of the casino sector. And therefore, the Philippines remained under the APG's enhanced monitoring or follow-up until this issue was addressed, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that's the reason why Republic Act 10927 was passed in 2017, correct? Yes, Your Honor. It finally included the casino sector as a covered person under the AML CFT regulation and supervision, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 
In the third ME of the Philippines in the year 2018, the Philippines was found only partially compliant with the FATF's recommendation six, or as I quote it, the targeted financial sanctions related to terrorism and terrorist financing, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that is why the AMLC proposed amendments to the Human Security Act to improve the country's compliance with the AF FATF recommendations, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So that is the economic motive for amending the Human Security Act, correct? I believe so, Your Honor. Okay. Are you aware of what the AMLC wanted by way of amendments to improve the country's compliance? No, Your Honor. Okay, I'll tell you. There were four, four non-negotiable items for the AMLC. And these are all accessible through Google, actually. It was important for AMLC to, com to comply with F FATF recommendations that one, there should be a designation ex parte of terrorist individuals. Two, implementation of targeted financial sanctions to, to stop the flow of funds. Three, evidentiary standards of probable cause when making designations. And four, criminality provisions for FTFs and the financing of, tra of travel of terrorists. And per my research, the amendments to the security, Human Security Act eventually became the ATA. Can you confirm that? Yes, Your Honor. And with the passage of the ATA, the Philippines is now one step closer to avoiding the risk of being included again in the FATF's gray list of countries, correct? Yes, Your Honor. As the ATA is currently worded, can you identify which provisions were necessary for the Philippines to avoid the FATF gray list? Your Honor, um, the Philippines could have uh, amended the uh, HSA uh, without violating constitutional rights, Your Honor. That's not my question. My question is, which provisions of the ATA actually address the concerns of the AMLC? Would well, you Your know? Honor, for one, the designation ex parte was placed in the ATA now. Yes, yeah, Section it's, 3B. Yes, Your Honor. What else? Uh, there is now the uh, implementation of targeted sanctions, also uh, ex parte by the AMLC, upon the either on its own. That's or, Section 25. Yes, what Your else? Honor. Uh, there's also the uh, uh, the travel travel ban, uh, for example. Probable cause is found as yes, an evidentiary. Uh, standard or as a, a standard for determining whether sanctions should be imposed in the ATA. Okay. So uh, let me continue it for you. So we're talking about section 3B on the definition of a designated person, section 11 A, B and C on the unlawful acts of foreign terrorists, section 25 on the de designation of terrorist associations, section 35 on the AMLAS or AMLC's authority to investigate, Section 36 on the AMLC's authority to freeze, Section 38 on safe harbor, and Section 46I on the function of the Anti-Terrorism Council. So, based on my reading, these provisions now address the concerns of the AMLC, so as to take the Philippines out of the gray list, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Do you know the definition of an FTF? Uh, Your Honor, that's a financial... No, it's a foreign, a foreign terrorist, terrorist fighter. Fight. Yes, Your Honor. And what's the definition, would you know? Uh, it's in the law, Your Honor. It's in the uh, Anti-Financing Terrorism Act. Or it's RG. actually in US and UNSC Resolution 2178. I'll read it for the record. Defines an FTF as, I quote, individuals who travel to the state other than their states of residence or nationality for the purpose of the perpetration, planning or preparation of, or participation in terrorist acts or the providing or receiving of terrorist uh, training, including in connection with the armed conflict, close quote. 
And the Anti-Terror Act, unlike the Human Security Act, has sought to address this by prescribing foreign terrorists in Section 11, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, aside from the ISIL link groups, would you know if the CPP NPA was also mentioned as a growing threat in the October 2019 ME report? I, uh, I am not sure, Your Honor. I only know that the ATC has designated the CPP NPA recently as a terrorist organization. Okay. Well, as, as a matter of provable fact, the CPP NPA was not mentioned in the October 2019 ME report. And yet, they are one of the first organizations designated by the ATC, as you, you just mentioned, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that designation is by virtue of resolutions issued by the ATC? Yes, Your Honor. That's resolution number 13. Sorry, what resolution is that? Uh, I cannot recall the number, Your Honor, but it's a fairly recent resolution. Resolution number 12, December 9, 2020. Yes, Your Honor. So would you agree with me after going through the legislative history or the historical antecedents to the passage of the Anti-Terror Act, that, the, that we have veered away from the original objective of the, that the, the reason for changing the Human Security Act? Well, Your Honor, if we read only the ATA, uh, it does not actually focus on the economic dimension of uh, addressing terrorism, if that is the question of your honor. Would you know if it's, ATA expands the definition of terrorus, terrorism as compared to the Human Security Act, right? Yes, your honor. Would you know if that was, that the need to expand that definition, was that a non-negotiable provision for the Anti-Money Laundering Council? I cannot speak for the MLC, your honor whether it was non-negotiable for them or not, but definitely uh, there was a choice to uh, improve the uh, definition of terrorism in the ATA. It was also a choice to stick with the old definition of terrorism in the Human Security Act. Okay, let me, let me answer my own question then. It was not, non, it was not a non-negotiable provision. In fact, in the sponsorship of Senator, sponsorship speech of Senator Laxon, the amendment of the definition does not appear to be in response to the APGME. But to quote him, quote, strengthen legal backbone, close quote, of the anti-terrorism law, and to ensure, quote, that it is clear, concise, and balanced. That's from the statement of Senator Laxon. Are you aware, aware of another pending bill in Senate in further response to the ME report? No, Your Honor. That Senate Bill number 1945 passed its third reading last January 25, 2021. Its salient features are to include real estate developers and brokers in the coverage of persons, among others. Okay. Is there an internationally accepted definition of terrorism in Usula? No, Your Honor, there is no universally accepted definition of terrorism. In fact, there are hundreds of proposed definitions of terrorism. During the interpolations of the Senate bill, Senator Laxon himself stated that there are over 109 definitions of terrorism. Do you confirm that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Section 4, it appears to me, was made more consistent with the UN's proposed Comprehensive Convention on, on International Terrorism. Do you confirm that? I do not think, Your Honor, that there's any um, a UN definition that is, uh, can be considered as closely similar to the definition in our ATA. Well, there is, in point of fact, a comprehensive convention on international terrorism, but it has not yet been signed as treaty, and the states remain in a deadlock over the definition of terrorism. Okay, thank you, Attorney Ursula. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I, uh, can I ask for Attorney Jokno? Uh, 
I'll be asking sure. you questions about facial challenge again for the nth time. Yes, sir. Okay. Generally, a facial challenge is not allowed against a penal statute, correct? Uh, generally, yes, sir. Mm. There is an exception, correct? Yes, for statutes that uh, restrict free speech, even if they are penal in nature. Yeah. That's in Disney versus Executive Secretary. Yes, Your Honor. What was the law assailed in that case? The Cybercrime Prevention Act, uh, Your Honor. By what remedial vehicle did the petitioners in that case come to the court? If I recall correctly, that was on certiorari, Your Honor, please. And prohibition? Yes. Directly to the court? Yes, Your Honor. What did the Sini say about facial challenges? Well, the ponente in that case um, said that facial challenges may be allowed for penal statutes that uh, restrict freedom of speech and cognate rights, if I remember correctly. Right? On grounds of overbreath or vagueness, yes, correct? Sir. Do I have the... I have a PowerPoint. It's not available. And... There you go. I just want to make sure that we're looking at the same language. There. I will quote it for the record. It says, a petitioner may, for instance, mount a facial challenge to the constitutionality of a statute, even if he claims no violation of his own rights, under the assailed statute, when it involves free speech on grounds of overbreath or vagueness of the statute. The rationale for this exception is to counter the chilling effect on protected speech that comes from statutes violating free speech. That's Did I correct. read that correctly? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Aside from the right of free speech, was there any other right implicated in Dicini apart from free speech? I believe the right to privacy was also involved in that case. Yes, in reference to Section 12 of the law on the real-time collection of traffic data, yes, correct? Right. Does the ATA regulate speech? Yes, Your Honor. It's very clear from Section 9, inciting to terrorism, as well as the other sections that create crimes, Sections 5, 6, 8, and 10 which all also refer to speech based on its content, if you're on your place. I turn again to what Justice Hernando was talking about earlier. Section four. It explicitly excludes advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, <coughs> industrial or mass action, and other similar exercises of, of civil and political rights when not intended to cause death, harm, endanger a person's life, or create a risk to public safety. It, did I read the law correctly? Yes, Your Honor. It appears to contain a double negative. It says that's, that's where I'm going. Yeah. Um, as a general rule, um, are all forms of speech and expression protected? Not all forms of speech. Your there Honor, are but there uh, are speeches and expressions not protected, correct? For example, obscenity, Your Honor, would uh, pornography, yes, Your seditious Honor. speech. They're not correct. Yes, Your Honor. But everything else, yes, it is protected. Especially political speech, Your Honor. Except that here under Section Four, it is language in a way that is different. It says, all of these acts of free speech are excluded, provided. There's a proviso. When not intended to cause death, harm, endanger a person's life, or create a risk to public safety. Am I correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So instead of enumerating the forms of speech and expression which are supposed to constitute terrorism, what Section 4 does, it only tells us the forms of speech and expression which do not constitute terrorism, correct? Yes, Your Honor, and that is one of our concerns with the definition. 
Must speech and expression rise to the level of sedition or inciting to sedition in order to fall under Section 4? The problem with Section 4, Your Honor, is that uh, it does not, it would seem to encompass even protected political speech. So, when read in relation to Section 9. So, in other words, it need not rise to the level and it may be covered by Section 4. Yes, Your Honor. Correct? And I think Chief Justice has discussed this earlier. There are other speech related provisions, correct? We're talking about Section 5, threat to commit terrorism. Section 8, proposal to commit terrorism. Section 9, inciting to commit terrorism. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Even a training, I think, would also include speech. Section, Section six, 6, collecting or making documents. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. That's speech related? Yes, Your Honor. What about publishing an, adv an advertisement or any information under Section 10? Is that speech related? That would also be speech related, Your Honor. And as you mentioned, under Section 12, training, expert, advice, or assistance. Correct? Would also involve speech. Yes, Your Honor. Can we therefore, so all of these punishable acts under the ATA involve both speech and conduct, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Can we conclude based on this in your position that a facial challenge on the grounds of vagueness and overbreath is proper? We submit that it is proper, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Attorney Jokna. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I, can I ask for Professor Mola? Good afternoon, Your Honor. You're, you're teaching in UP? Yes, Your Honor. That's a very good school. Thank you, Your Honor. You are generous, Your Honor. <laughs> you're a professor of constitutional law. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. There are other cases where the court has allowed a facial challenge against statutes, even if they're not speech regulating, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I refer you to Imbong versus Chowa. Yes, Your Honor. Correct? Yes, what, Your Honor. what law was assailed in that case? I believe it was the reproductive health law, Your Honor, okay. the RH law. There's an express statement by the court there that says that the facial challenge has been expanded to, and I quote, cover statutes not only regulating free speech, but also those involving religious freedom and other fundamental rights, correct? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Do you know, what was the court's reason for allowing the petition here? In Imbong, Your Honor, um, I believe some of the petitioners felt that their right either to speech or belief were being burdened by the RH law, Your Honor. There's language there. I'm sorry, I cannot see it myself. Uh, yes, there, the second paragraph. The, the underlying speech. reason for this modification is simple, for unlike its counterpart in the U.S., this court under its expanded jurisdiction is mandated by the fundamental law not only to settle actual controversies involving rights, which are legally demandable and enforceable, but also for determining whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amount, amounting to lack of or excessive jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. Correct? I copied that correctly? Yes, Your Honor. I believe, I believe that is correct, which is precisely the reason why uh, facial challenge came from the U.S. Constitution, which doesn't even have expanded judicial review why we the 1987 constitution on its face already has expanded but there must review. be a showing of grave abuse yes your honor okay so in the case of imbong the case was allowed to prosper correct yes your honor are you familiar with the case of spark versus Quezon city yes your honor what was involved there your honor those were the curfew ordinances of i believe three cities Quezon city manila and navotas and navotas yes your honor how was it brought to the court? Also by facial challenge, Your Honor. P by what kind of petition? Uh, Rule 65, Your Honor, I believe. Certiorari and prohibition? Yes, Your Honor. What was the standard uh, used by the court for it to proceed? Strict scrutiny, Your Honor. No, not yet. Uh, it was grave abuse. Yes, Your Honor. Correct? There must be a prima facie showing of grave abuse. Who's the ponente here? Uh, that would be the Senior Associate Justice Estella Perlas. Uh, she, had, she asked me to ask you. So. <laughs> so let me draw your attention to the last line. What does it say? I'm sorry. It, it says, Your Honor, that 
this requirement is simplified by merely requiring a prima facie showing of grave abuse of discretion in the Assailed Government Act. Okay. So the standard for grave abuse is a prima facie showing, correct? Yes, Your Honor. What was the right implicated here? Uh, right to travel, Your Honor. And the, and the petition was allowed to continue, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. In these present consolidated petitions, 37 of them, do they allege the violation or, con or curtailment of other rights? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, it goes into one of our claims that it is an issue that is both critical and uh, of novel because by my count, out of the 21 items in the Bill of Rights, the ATA is the first law that infringes 15. 15? Yes, Your Honor. And you mentioned the Bill of Rights. Yes, Your Honor. Meaning the rights that are implicated are textually found in the Constitution. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, let's go through each one. So, due process? Yes, Your Honor. Liberty from unreasonable arrest and detention? Yes, Your Honor. Section That's three. Section 29, Section, yes, Your according Honor. to you, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Security from unreasonable search and seizure? Section two. Yes, Your Honor. 16. Yes, Your Honor. Privacy. Ah, yes, Your Honor. Section, Section 36. 36. Okay. Freedom of association. Ah, yes, Your Honor. Section 10. Section 10. Right to travel. Yes, Your Honor. Section 34. Okay. So, can we agree that all of these rights are fundamental? Oh, yes, Your Honor. They have been declared in several decisions of the Honorable Court as fundamental. And because they are found textually in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, correct? Yes, Your Honor. As such, in these situations, the government is subjected to a higher burden of proof to justify intrusions into these interests, correct? Yes, Your Honor. It's a strict scrutiny or the double standard of judicial review has already kicked in. It carries the heavy burden of unconstitutionality. So strict scrutiny in equal protection cases and compelling state interest in due process cases, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And in these situations, the, the, the normal rule that a law is presumed constitutional is reversed, correct? Yes, Your Honor, because um, the presumption of constitutionality applies 99.9% .9 of the time. But if Congress chooses a means that implicates fundamental rights, then that falls within strict scrutiny already. The burden is reversed. Did you read the concurring and dissenting opinion of the amicus curiae in Versosa versus People? And his concurring opinion in falsis. In concur, yes, in falsis, Your Honor. He, Justice Hardelesa emphasized that uh, where a liberty interest has been accorded an elevated status by characterizing it as a fundamental right, the government is subject to a higher burden of proof to justify intrusions into these interests, namely the requirements of strict scrutiny in equal protection cases and that of compelling state interest in due process cases. Close quote. Do you agree with the statement? I agree with the statement. Even if he's here. Oh, de definitely I agree <laughs> even more because he is here. <laughs> more so. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Do you agree with me that we can call these rights fundamental rights because they are textually found in the Constitution? Yes, Your Honor. So I'm pushing now to what is the threshold issue before the court? And this is how I formulate it. And tell me if you agree with me. It is whether the ATA curtails not only the exercise of free, free speech, but also other fundamental rights. Do you agree with my formulation? I agree with that, Your Honor. Is this threshold issue a question of law? Yes, Your Honor. That is not a question of fact? Not a question of fact, Your Honor. So, again, in your opinion, although I think I know already what your answer is, since the ATA involves other fundamental rights, can we conclude that a facial challenge is proper pursuant to Imbong? Yes, Your Honor, as well as Nicholas Lewis, Your Honor. Okay. Now let's go to another case. This one penned by the same amicus, Geo Samar versus DOTC. How do you relate the facial challenge to the ATA with the court's pronouncements in this case? In Geo Samar, Your Honor. Yes. I actually subscribe to the same judicial philosophy as uh, our amicus, Your Honor, judicial restraint. I believe Dio Samar was a judicial restraint of Ponencia, and it followed the double standard of judicial review. That is, since Dio Samar was a dispute about where or how to bid out an airport and not about civil and political liberties, then you may approach it as a rational basis test. 
However, here we are confronted with the double standard of judicial review, civil and political rights. Therefore, a higher scrutiny is required, strict scrutiny, Your Honor. Okay. After that case was National Federation of Hog Farmers, dated June 23, 2020, versus the Board of Investments, where the court found that the case was not justiciable following Geo Summer. In yes. July 2020, the court and bank was likewise, likewise unanimous in joint ship manning group to not take cognizance of the petition. Do you remember that case? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So this is what I'm going to ask you to fully develop in your memorandum, okay? Yes, Your Honor. With these cases, Imbong, Spark, then you have Geo Samar, and then you have the Hogs and the Joint Ship, where do these petitions of yours, these 37 petitions, where do they situate? Okay? That we I, will do that, Your Honor. I want a very robust discussion. We will do so, yeah. Okay. All right. Let me turn, uh, Attorney Molo, to the case Justice Mundo mentioned last week, Sessions versus DiMaia. That's a U.S. case? I believe so, Your Honor, Justice okay. Kagan. Yes. He recognized the void for vagueness doctrines as being color corollary to the principle of separation of powers. How do you understand this? Your Honor, void for vagueness offends due process on two respects. Procedural due process because it does not allow fair notice of what conduct is being prescribed. And second, on substantive due process because it allows our officers to arbitrarily select when to apply. In relation to the separation of powers. Um, and in, under separation of powers, Your Honor, I believe it implicates it because there's an undue delegation aspect of a void for vagueness uh, attack. That so means... The crime is already defined effectively by law enforcers instead of the legislature. Let me try to rephrase that and tell me if you agree with me. Yes, Your Honor. The vagueness, the vagueness doctrine requires that Congress, rather than the executive or the judiciary, define what conduct is sanctionable and what is not. I agree, Your Honor. That is essentially what Justice Kagan is saying here, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Even if Sessions is a U.S. case, do you agree that the court is likewise confronted with the same situation here? Yes, Your Honor. Here we have a penal law that defines a punishable conduct based on the intent of the offender and leaves to the courts or to law enforcement agents and enforcers to determine which acts manifest the punishable intent. Am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. I go back to Section 4 and the phrase, Advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, and other similar exercises are only excluded when not intended to cause death, harm, and danger a person's life or create a risk to public safety. Who determines whether the act is done or not done for these purposes? It would be the law enforcer, Your Honor. In a situation where a person is arrested by the... Uh, police operatives and later on is hailed to court and the court rules favorably for the accused and acquits the accused. What happens in the meantime? He will be detained, Your Honor. Aside from that? He will be under trial, Your Honor. He will be deprived of his... What about his assets? Oh, they will be frozen, Your Honor. What about his communications? Under house arrest, Your Honor, everything is uh, prohibited. And subject to surveillance? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So I arrive at the conclusion that it is up to the accused that it is his burden to assert that he did not, he did not have the punishable intent under the ATA, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Justice Mon was correct in saying earlier that there's a presumption of innocence and that the burden to prove the intent still rests with the prosecution, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But when a person is detained for the first 14 days and his lawyers come to his rescue, what will they file? Well, they will try to file habeas corpus. A what? Habeas corpus, Your Honor. Uh, sorry? When he's detained, Your Honor, yes. habeas corpus. Habeas corpus. And who has the burden of proof in the habeas corpus? It should be the government. 
And if, if, and should be the government? I'm sorry, but the pit. Sorry, you're, you're breaking up. I'm sorry. Can you use another mic? Okay, so let's let's go through what happens in a habeas corpus. Yes, Your Honor. So you file a petition for habeas corpus. Yes, Your Honor. And habeas corpus means by what authority did you detain my client? Correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the prosecutor will say by virtue of the ATA law because he was designated under Section 25. Yes, correct? Your Honor. And therefore, what you have to do now is to prove that you had no intent to cause these things. Yes, Your Honor. Correct? Yes, Your so Honor. So effectively, effectively, the role is reversed. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. You prove your innocence. That is the effective effect of this one. Am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. I, I think um, that is actually the odious uh, aspect of the law, Your Honor. And what is the, what is the job of the court there in the Tabias Corpus case? What is the... What is the crucial question that the court has to satisfy itself with. Whether the detention is lawful, Your Honor. Whether there was punishable intent, correct? Oh, yes, Your Honor. Are there any, are there any minimum guidelines in the law to guide law enforcement in determining intent? As written, no, Your Honor. Okay, let me segue into another point. One of the challenges you've raised is the constitutionality of Section 29, which grants the ATC the power to issue, to issue a written authority for the detention of a person suspect, suspected of committing terrorism, correct? Yes, Your Honor. For purposes of detaining that person for 14 days, extendable for another 10 days, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that power is granted to whom? To the ATC, Your Honor. And what is the composition of the ATC? They are um, the secretary. They are chaired by the executive secretary, the secretary of um, information communication case, mostly cabinet men, Your Honor, and part of the armed forces. What is the effect of a written authority like this? What happens to the person subject of that written authority? They will be detained for 14 days, Your Honor. Similar to a warrant of arrest? Yes, Your Honor. So... In terms of effect, it's the same. There's a deprivation of liberty, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Under the Constitution, who has the power to determine probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest? Only a judge, Your Honor. That's Article 3, Section 2 of the 1987 Constitution, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Personally by the judge? Yes, Your Honor. In Salazar versus Achacoso, the court categorically ruled there that under the 1987 Constitution, only judges and no other may issue warrants of arrest, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But here we have Section 29, which grants the ATC, which is not a court, the power to, to issue a piece of paper that will effect a deprivation of liberty, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And if I may add, the IRRs made it worse because the IRRs for Section 29 actually say that even if there's no written authority yet, you can detain, and then you can get it after. So if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. It's the dog with a different color, Your Honor. I was using duck. Oh, yes, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. So simply by virtue of the operation of Section 29, the court, this court, is now confronted with an issue 
we're relating to a violation of the separation of powers, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Because on the one hand, we have the Constitution that says only judges can issue warrants of arrest. But here, this law says ATC can issue a piece of paper that effectively operates as a warrant of arrest. Am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. Actually, that is our key uh, argument in separation of powers against Section 29. Because the real proposition of the ATA is, can Congress, by, by simply citing a national security concern, get a core function of the judiciary and then turn it over to the executive branch? Okay. Would you consider this issue on the validity or constitutionality of Section 29 a question of law or a question of fact? It's a pure question of law, Your Honor. And therefore, can the court take cognizance of this and resolve this issue pursuant to its expanded power of judicial review? Yes, Your Honor. Can we conclude that by the mere enactment of this provision, there is justiciable controversy that is actually ripe for judicial review? Yes, Your Honor. Under the, lo <clears throat> under the long uh, held doctrine of Pimentel v. Aguirre, which was recently reiterated by the Honorable Court through the esteemed Chief Justice in New Billy Bid Prisons versus SOJ. Okay. Before I let you go, let me segue to designation and pros pros prescription. What is the difference? Can you educate me? Your Honor, designation is actually issued by the ATC. Mm -hmm. But proscription is supposedly through the Court of Appeals, Your Honor. Upon petition of the DOJ? Yes, Your Honor. So, what, proscription is section what? 12? Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, it's 26, Your Honor. 26. Yeah. So, the DOJ or the SOJ, my good friend, Secretary Guevara, he's a member of the... ATC, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Don't you think that it would be easier for him as the SOJ to merely designate a person as terrorist instead of having to litigate that issue before the Court of Appeals? Yes, Your Honor. So what's the difference between designate and prescription? Well, it seems to me designation already achieves the purpose of prescription. That's another argument we raised in our petition, Your Honor, because the ATA makes it appear that the judges or the CA has a role. But in terms of effect, we actually created the table that you can reach all of your targets through designation instead of prescription. So there is really no incentive to go through prescription, Your Honor. It's faster and it's virtually as pointed out by the Honorable Justice. It's the same people. So, so when you designate that allows AMLC to already freeze your accounts, correct? Yes, Your Honor. What is it about prescription that is not a consequence of, of a mere designation? Well, it's more long-lasting, Your Honor. I, I believe uh, what we found is it, the period is uh, far longer than designation. But, okay. but in terms of actually freezing the account, you can only... Uh, detaining the individual. You can already do that after designation, Your Honor. So they're the same, correct? Well, based on our study, Your Honor, uh, earnestly, yes, Your Honor. That's why we made the argument. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Molo. Can I go to Attorney Colmenares, please? Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Attorney. Are you familiar with the case of Southern Hemisphere versus Anti-Terrorism Council? We've reviewed that, Your Honor. Okay. In that case, the court denied review of the provisions of the Human Security Act, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. That's the language. The reason the court denied review was because the petitioner in that case failed to show, and I quote, a credible threat of prosecution, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Am I correct to say that a facial challenge against a penal, a penal statute would be allowed if there is a showing of a reasonable certainty 
of a perceived threat to constitutional rights. Yes, Your Honor. Other than the uh, uh, arguments of Attorney Molo, that's an additional argument, Your Honor. Please. Okay. In fact, the, what, what, what Southern Hemisphere quotes by way of authority is Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, 561 US 1, in the year 2010. Yes, Your Honor. So if the petitioners here, and that's the reason I called you, are able to demonstrate a credible threat of prosecution, the court can facially determine the constitutionality of the ATA? Yes, Your Honor. That's, an, that additional, that's an additional argument, Your Honor. Okay. Under Section 25 of the ATA and Rule 6.3 of the IRR, the ATC may designate individuals, groups of persons, organizations, upon finding of probable cause that said entities commit or attempt to commit to conspire or participate in the commission of acts penalized under sections 4 to 12, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Has the CPP-NPA been designated as a terrorist organization? We read that uh, the resolution number 12 was issued by the ATC designating the CPP-NPA as a terrorist organization, Your Honor. Okay. And since CPP-NPA has already been designated a terrorist organization, any person or, or organization that, does, that has some affiliation would also be subject to designation, correct? That is our interpretation, Your Honor, especially since under HSA, they filed a prescription proceedings, not only against the CBP NPA, but 600 other individuals, Your Honor, including a UN Special Rapporteur. Those 600, Your Honor, that were whittled down by the court, saying that these are activists, these are dissenters, and so on, and the DOJ, I think, withdrew, and I think there are only two persons left, I think, in the prescription proceedings, although it was overtaken now by the... Uh, by the ATA, that's why they probably don't need to go through with the proscription because, as mentioned a while ago, they can still achieve the same things through the administrative proceedings of, uh, well, designation, Your Honor. I'm sorry, you have, to, you have to educate me again. What proceeding are you talking about? Well, uh, the basis for my uh, assertion that the, it will include uh, those related to, they think, related to... No, 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 to, no. You mentioned a proceeding in the Court of Appeals? The DOJ no, filed uh, an action already for prescription? RTC, Your Honor, under the HSA. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, that was before. Mm -hmm. So it is still pending when the ATA was, was approved. So uh, we so, don't know if that will still prosper or not. But the fact is they link in the prescription proceedings a lot of activists, a lot of dissenters, Your Honors, which were later on dropped in the prescription proceedings. Then, so, Your Honor. Well, I didn't know that. So... So I would imagine that case will now be functus official because all the ATC has to do is to designate all of these people, correct? That is a question, I think, before this court because I think that was asked by Senator Lacson. So what happens to all these things? Will they just continue under HSA? And that's what they did, Your Honor, sorry, under ATA. In that designation, uh, number 12, uh, if I remember reading the resolution number 12, they allege that a prescription proceeding was filed in 2018, before the ATA, Your Honor. Mm. And secondly, enumerating 12 incidents which happened before the ATA, Your Honor. And so this uh, designation was actually based on our reading of resolution number 12 on acts committed, allegedly committed by the CPP NPA even before the effectivity of the ATA, Your Honor. Okay. So, so that is one reason why some, uh, some of us contend that it can also be a bill of attainder and an ex post facto law, Your Honor. Okay. All of which you will be elaborating on in your memorandum, I assume. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to go back to this phrase, purported affiliated organizations. Can they already be prosecuted even as they are not yet designated so long as they're purported affiliated organizations of CPP and PA? I believe so, Your Honor. Section 29 actually allows suspects. Even if you're not designated, you can be arrested under Section 29 for being suspected, Your Honor. And as well as subjected to surveillance. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. The clients of Professor Molo 
are distinguished members of the legal profession and they filed suit to declare the ATA unconstitutional. My question to you is, does that mean that they are affiliated with the CPP NPA and therefore engage in terrorism? I don't think so, Your Honor. One of you, I don't remember who, I don't know if it's Attorney uh, Cadiz, brought to our attention a social media post purportedly authored by Lieutenant General Antonio Parladi of the AFP. I understand that this post called on the public to be watchful of par parties opposing the ATA. In fact, the post says, and I quote, very soon, blood debts will be settled. The long arm of the law will catch, catch up on you and your supporters, close quote. First off, would you agree that posting the statement could be considered as an act intended to cause harm? Well, that's the interpretation, Your Honor, because, uh, you know, many of those Red Dot have been killed or arrested, Your Honor. Be before they were killed, there was been Red Dotting against them, Your Honor. And so, therefore, it not only chilled, but, of course, the, uh, the oppositors, because they were also threatened under this uh, social uh, social uh, media post uh, could feel that uh, that was the intention, Your Honor. And that is why I think it was also a subject of a motion on the part of former Justice Carpio, Your Honor. Okay. I don't know General Parlade personally, but I understand that he's the spokesperson of the National Task Force to end the local communist armed conflict. Is, he, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And that this is the NTF ELCAC attached to the office of the president. Correct. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. To your knowledge, has General Parlade denied saying those statements? I don't think so, Your Honor. In fact, he seems to have admitted saying it, Yes, right? yes, Your Honor. And in fact, he, I think he apologized for saying it. I don't remember the apology, Your Honor, but for us, the meaning of an apology is this. If you apologize but will not promise to stop your red tagging, then that, uh, that apology is not sincere, Your Honor. Okay. The only sincere apology is when you also say, I will stop red tagging people henceforth. Well, I'm referring to a Manila Times article, uh, the favorite newspaper of Justice Marvick, which quotes a, a General Parlade as stating that he erred in posting about the groups challenging the ATA. Would you agree that the fact that General Parladi has contradicted himself in calling petitioners as terrorists supports the claim that the ATA is vague? Yes, Your Honor. Because if it was easy to interpret and to understand, then no such mistake would be made, right? Yes, Your Honor. Would the exercise of one's right to seek judicial relief by questioning a purportedly unconstitutional law constitute terrorism? No, Your Honor, but that's the problem of, of, of the ATC, Your Honor, if I may add. The ATC is composed of the most powerful agencies in the country. They practically regulate the entire society. Uh, the ICT on all communications, AMLC on all financial business transactions, of course, PNP, AFP, and even DOLE is part of that, Your Honor, on labor and business. And their statements, Your Honor, uh, really matter a lot. They have the awesome, awesome powers of prosecution, Your Honor. That is why uh, it really uh, causes a lot of dismay on, the lot, on those victims of red tagging uh, charges uh, made by members of the ATC, Your Honors. Excuse my next question, uh, Attorney Colmenares, but have you yourself been red tagged? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, they publicly admitted that I am under surveillance, and that they've said, uh, I'm, they allege that even in the Senate, Your Honor, and we've answered that forcefully in the Senate, Your Honor, that where is your evidence? We've always asked them, so why don't you file cases in court, Your Honors? Let me ask you personally then, do you, do you feel that there is a credible threat of prosecution hanging over your head? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The fact that many of our activist colleagues have been dispersed in rallies, Your Honor, on the ground that they endanger lives and public health, or on the red tagging on us, and these the public statements of surveillance and the allegations that we are CPP NPA, are all uh, does not even does not provide us comfort, Your, Your Honor. In fact, it continues to chill us. That is the reason why uh, we believe that is a credible threat of prosecution, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Attorney Colmenares. Can you. Can I ask for? Uh, Professor Molo again. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, 
I'll try to go through this fast because a lot of the other justices just want to ask also. Yes, Your Honor. Professor Molo, under the Human Security Act, the definition of terrorism includes an enumeration of what you have called predicate crimes. Yes, Your Honor. Qualified by the phrase, and I quote, thereby sowing and creating a condition of widespread and extraordinary fear and panic among the populace in order to coerce the government to give in to an unlawful demand, close quote, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. These predicate crimes under the Human Security Act are actually crimes punishable by the revised penal code and special laws, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So we have piracy, mutiny, rebellion or insurrection, coup d'etat, murder, kidnapping and serious illegal detention, crimes involving destruction under Article 324 of the revised penal code, the law on arson, RA number 6969, 5207, 6235, which is anti-hijacking, 532, anti-piracy and anti-highway robbery, PD 1866, illegal and unlawful possession, manufacture, and disposition of firearms. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And all of these crimes, since they are defined by the revised penal code or by the special law, they have specific elements, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, for example, in the crime of piracy, one of the elements is that the offenders attack or seize the vessel. Yes, correct? Your Honor. In rebellion or insurrection, one of the elements is a public uprising and taking arms against the government, correct? Yes, Your Honor. In coup d'etat, as mentioned by Justice Alex yesterday, or last week, a swift attack accompanied by violence, intimidation, threat, strategy, or stealth. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Murder is a person is killed, and it's attended by the qualifying circumstances of murder, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Kidnapping and serious illegal detention, a physical act of kidnapping or detaining another, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And in the crimes involving destruction, destruction as an act, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, in order to accuse a person with terrorism under the Human Security Act, he or she must have performed first an overt act that is a component of these predicate crimes, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So that by virtue of the respective elements of these predicate crimes, would you agree with me that the offending conduct would be clear and unambiguous. Yes, Your Honor. Such that the punishable conduct, conduct under the predicate crimes would be clear to anyone or to, in quotes, men of common intelligence, correct? Yes, Your Honor. As, as contradistinguished, the human, sorry, the Anti-Terror Act does not list down predicate crimes it lists down predicate acts, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Let's go to the, to the meat of this. Acts intended to cause death or serious bodily injury to any person and dangerous person's life. That's the first predicate act. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. There's a phrase here. Um, sorry, we're section four? Yes, Your Honor. It says, regardless of the stage of execution. How do you understand that? Your Honor, I believe it refers to the attempted, frustrated, and uh, consummated stages in the RPC. Does it? Well, it, it, it obviates that, Your Honor, because it says, regardless of the state of execution. Okay. Okay. So, attempted murder, is it within the purview of this predicate act? Yes, Your Honor. How do you define attempted murder? Sorry, let's go back to Criminal Law 101. Sorry, I know you're a Constitution Law um, Professor, but you passed uh, the bar. Okay, I, I will. Um, Your Honor, uh, attempted murder means that a person has begun Com the mm. elements of committing the crime of murder by, but by overt, overt acts. acts. Mm. And, and did not finish, did not perform, perform all, all, of, the, all the elements of execution. 
acts of execution which should produce the the, the felony the felony by reason of some cause or accident other uh, than other than his own volition okay. I'm frustrated he frustrated. performs all the acts yes your honor but the felony doesn't arise by reason of causes independent of his will yes Correct? your honor consummated of course napatay niya yes your honor so at any stage whether it's attempted frustrated consummated an overt and an equivocal act was committed yes your honor Correct? such that even in the attempted stage an external act is performed yes your honor okay since we are in criminal law 101 i will ask you if a merely displays a weapon against b and you will be graded by justice marvick here he's practicing for the bar exams if a merely displays a weapon against b but does nothing more he does not brandish the weapon if it's a knife he does not aim it if it's a firearm he also doesn't utter any threat but in his heart a wants to kill b would that be attempted murder without an overt act no your honor it's not yes sir. okay because intent is uh, intent is in the mind, Your Honor. Yes. So until that point there is, where there is an overt act that is committed, we cannot even begin to talk about attempted stage, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So where A in our situation merely thinks, desires, wants to kill B, but does nothing, there is no crime. Yes, Your Honor. And this is a basic principle in criminal law that the only way by which you may ascertain or ascertain intent is through the outward act or conduct of the offender, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But under the ATA, there's that phrase, acts intended to cause. So again, my same example, I possess a deadly weapon, I really want to kill B, but I do nothing else would my act of possessing such weapon with a desire to kill B, will that make me fall under Section 4 already? Yes, Your Honor. And the appreciation of the law enforcer reading it, Your Honor. Because nature and purpose, he, can, he is very flexible. So the, it's really because of the intent. Yes, Your Honor. So even as he is not committing any overt act, if an intent can be imputed to him, Pasok siya sa section 4. Yes, Your Honor. This applies as well to sections 4B and 4C? I believe so, Your Honor. So, again, I go back to the phrase, regardless of the stage of execution. All right? Remember my example. He has not done anything except possess with a desire in his heart. And yet, he falls under section 4 according to you. In that particular case, the law enforcer says, no, you have the intent. Eh. So what does that mean, regardless of the stage of execution? Your Honor, it, it, it covers anything, even if you have not done any overt act. And um, that's what really makes it vague, Your Honor. Uh, if I may, what you just described, Your Honor, is also punishable under Section 6 merely possessing so the threshold for the predicate acts under the ata can Go we say that it is lower than yes your honor it goes way beyond in time in terms of attempted all right parang minority peer report your honor the movie <laughs> okay that was one of my favorite movies huh? yes your honor it reminds me of that movie Aside from these predicate acts, Section 4 requires specific purposes, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Should be to intimidate the general public or a segment thereof, to create an atmosphere or spread a message of fear, to provoke or influence by intimidation, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So unlike the Human Security Act, 
widespread panic or fear is no longer necessary. Only the intimidation of the general public is enough. Yes, Your Honor. And for determining these purposes, you likewise have to go into the intent of the perpetrator. Do you agree? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Again, is there a criteria on when, for instance, the government is intimidated or provoked? Well, there's none on the face of the law, Your Honor. In the IRR? None, Your Honor. Is there a criteria on when public safety is undermined? None, Your Honor. IRR? None, Your Honor. Is there a criteria when there is an atmosphere of fear under the law? None, Your Honor. Under the IRR? None as well. Is it even necessary that the purpose is actually achieved? No, Your Honor, as long as it's intended to cause. So I go to my $64 question. Would you agree that the presence or absence of these purposes is also subject to interpretation? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, if, if I may, I would quote an article written by the esteemed Vicente V. Mendoza in the Inquirer, and he started with the phrase, the ATA is hard to understand, end quote. Okay. That's Vivi Mendoza himself, Your Honor. Whether an act is punishable or not under the ATA, is that subject to interpretation? Yes, Your Honor. Whose interpretation? It would be the law enforcer, Your Honor. This is my, my own sense of what happened. Operationally or as things happen on the ground, the law officers will deduce, will conclude in their minds that an act that is being done in front of them has a bad intention. Yes, Your Honor. And on that basis, on the, on the language of ATA, they will be fully authorized to effect an arrest. Yes, Your Honor. And detain that person for 14 days, plus an additional 10 days, during which time he is allowed to look for evidence to show na, oops, tama pala yung aking hinala. Yes, Your Honor. That's what it means. Yes, right? Your Honor. But in the meantime, the person is incarcerated for 24 days. Yes, Your Honor. And later on, if the court says, Oy, Mr. Policeman, walang basis yung hinala mo. How, how do we recompense this person for the 24 days of deprivation of liberty? None, Your Honor. It has been obliterated, Your Honor. And there's no liability. Article 125 does not apply here. And even during those 24 days, his assets are frozen? Yes, Your Honor. Everything stops? Yes, Your Honor. So... Going now to people who dissent, and I have a lot of experience there, together with Justice Murphy. Anybody who dissents or exercises fundamental liberties, can they be already subjected to surveillance interception under Section 16? Yes, Your Honor. Faced with these repercussions, those who want to speak or to exercise their right to free speech, they would have to ensure that their expression does not come within the scope of the purposes enumerated in Section 4, right? Yes, Your Honor. Or would they simply err on the side of caution and not say anything anymore? That is already happening, Your Honor. What do you call that effect? It's called chilling effect, Your Honor. Thank you, Attorney Mona. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Justice, uh, yeah, Justice Ami. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, may I have uh, Professor Ursula, please?
Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Professor Ursula. Okay, uh, among the arguments of petitioners is uh, Section 3H condemns an individual organization, association, or group of persons as terrorists based on the mere say so of the United Nations Security Council or the UNSC without the benefit of hearing, contrary to the constitutional guarantees of due process and presumption of innocence, to the extent that it makes the aforesaid persons guilty by association, the provision bears the hallmarks of an ex post facto law and a bill of attainder. Professor, how do you propose the government should treat the UN listed world terrorists? Uh, Your Honor, let me just say that uh, the uh, consolidated list of the Security, Security Council has been the focus of extreme criticism from many scholars. And in fact, there's been a pushback from international tribunals, uh, international and domestic tribunals, for example. The so European how should the government you propose should uh, treat this uh, UN-listed world terrorist? Your Honor, there should be no automatic adoption. No automatic adoption. Yes, so do we have the duty to verify or validate this list? Your Honor, the, uh, we believe that, that the, yes. uh, the Philippines should do yes. that. Yes, okay. So uh, should we summon the UN suspected terrorists one by one into our country to make the verification? Your or Honor, should we just first wait for them to come on their own? Your Honor, the, the last one could certainly be um, a choice, Your Honor, but in any case, automatic adoption uh, by the law uh, should not be done, Your Honor. All right, but and validation is a must. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, as all right, and you only would like to give a government uh, a window how it will do the validation or yes, verification. Your Honor. Very well. Okay, once they're here, what are we going to do with them? Your Honor, uh, are you asking me if yes, the law Yes, I am important? asking you once they're here, how, how do you propose we should do with them? What, what should we do with them? Your Honor, there are many, there are several choices that the government can do. Perhaps the government can make a uh, any preliminary uh, investigation, investigation. Or investigation. So, who of... should investigate them? Your Honor. Who should investigate uh, them? The government. Intelligence agencies can do that, Your Honor. Law who? enforcement agents. All right. Intelligence agencies, law enforcement agents. All right, very well. So, what do you think the UN Security Council did before? it uh, came out with the identification and inclusion of these persons or associations on the list of world terrorists. What did it first do? If no. at all it did something before the inclusion of this uh, so-called terrorist on the UN lists? My understanding, Your Honor, is that uh, under 1267, and the 1373 resolutions of the UN Security Council, uh, states are able to, uh, to give names yes. uh, to be included in the consolidated list. Uh, based on my understanding also that the, the submission of the names is based solely on secret intelligence, which often is not shared by states when they make the request for the inclusion in the consolidated list. Very fact, well, very well. All right, so uh, do you think the UN Security Council and all the states that provided the names of suspected world terrorists, of course, they did not just pick these names randomly without a prior, let alone thorough verification using the most advanced and sophisticated means available to them, especially 
to the five superpower members of the Security Council, right? My opinion, Your Honor, is that cannot be assumed. In some cases... Uh, so you we doubt? There is doubt that uh, they may have erred or they may have been reckless. And they may have uh, used uh, crude means uh, in arriving at this uh, list. I'm saying, Your Honor, that we cannot assume yes. how the, uh, the names or what was the basis for the submission of the names. Because in cases decided, for example, by uh, international tribunals, the states that were asked to provide uh, the basis yes. for we the cannot listing. even assume due diligence. We cannot assume, Your we Honor. We cannot presume due diligence. We cannot assume regularity. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. All right. In terms of verification, what else do you think we still can do, which the five superpower members of the UN Security Council or the providing states overlooked or failed to do? Um, in one decision, uh, there was a, there was a, or rather, in one study, there was a a suggestion uh, that there could be a bilateral dialogue or discussion. So uh, my, my question, I would like to repeat, is what is it that we still can do that the UN Security Council and even the states providing the names of the suspected terrorists failed to do? before they came up with this uh, list that us, the Republic of the Philippines, is the only one which can do. Your Honor, that was my point earlier when I said we cannot assume that uh, due diligence was in fact done in each particular yes. case when the listing was made. Secondly, uh, if there is no judicial scrutiny, for example, of the basis of the, the designation in the consolidated list. So we cannot, we cannot also assume what our country, little as it may be, can still do or not do well, your with Honor, respect to the validation or verification of these lists. Your Honor, I believe... Uh, uh, maybe we could change your microphone. Uh, Your Honor, I believe that there, can, there are tools that can be used by our intelligence agencies, not necessarily because we're a small country, we're a poor country, that our law enforcement uh, agencies uh, cannot exercise due diligence and exer or, or observe prudence yes. in uh, their investigation. And I we think ought to have a budget for that. And it is our duty. They have a budget, Is Your it Honor. our duty to allot a budget? For yes, Your verification Honor. of this. List. I understand, Your Honor, that our intelligence agencies now enjoy a huge budget, and uh, we submit that uh, for as long as hard work and diligence are yeah, observed. Yeah, but that is supposed to be confidential. How did you know? Your Honor, it's, it's intelligence a, fund. You're not supposed to know. It's Neither public record, do Your Honor. I, huh? Your Honor, I Am think I it's supposed public record. To know? All right. So, meantime, we're busy serving their right to due process. Are we supposed to keep them in custody or just let them go, at least uh, provisionally? Your Honor, it depends on circumstances. What petitioners are saying are, uh, one of the things that petitioners are saying is, the automatic adoption by the law, by the ATA, of the consolidated, consolidated list of the U.S. Security Council is fraught with um, a lot of um, dangers, Your Honor. Uh, there could be, for example, a mistake in names. There could be similarity in circumstances that simply led to the inclusion in the consolidated list. In other words, it, the automatic adoption should not be an option. Professor, you know, uh, when we deal with terrorism, time is always of the essence because of the lurking danger that may be irreparable in terms of loss of lives of our people. So my question again is, should we, what are we going to do with them? Meantime that we are validating their inclusion on the list, are we going to keep them in custody or let them go, at least provisionally? At, based alone huh, on the fact that uh, a person is listed 
on the UN world list of terrorists? Your Honor, um, a, our authorities would have the option, for example, of preventing entry into, into the country. But it doesn't mean that we adopt automatically the consolidated consolidated list so uh, we are not so those uh, that are on the list are not automatically barred from being accepted into our country i'm saying your honor that it could be an option yes it is so they're not automatically barred right not all of them it's the option of the state yes your honor all right so uh, if the state uh, assuming that the state allows their entry and uh, provisionally uh, let them go. Many time that the state is uh, investigating or validating his or her inclusion in the list. Uh, will, that not, will that not unduly expose our people, our children, women, men, old, and young alike? to grave irreparable danger that may even result in a heavy death toll, intense or even hundreds or thousands of lost lives. In the first place, Your Honor, if uh, there was that danger, then our authorities should decide not to allow entry into our territory. Uh, can, you, can you actually uh, perceive a possibility that the state will err? in its uh, judgment, whether if our line is this, that we're going to validate first, validate. Is it uh, at least even just a 1% possibility that the state in making a judgment call, whether to accept or not, or whether to release in the meantime or detain in the meantime can commit an error that will be irreparable. Yes, Your Honor, that, that definitely is a possibility. Yes. So uh, would you agree that even the most doubting Thomas in the world cannot say with absolute certainty that the threat of terrorism coming from this UN tag terrorists or even the domestic kalitag terrorists will never happen. We cannot say that. Yes, Your Honor. no certainty at all. That is correct, Your Honor. Because there will always be at least a 1% possibility that the threat coming from these people can actually translate into a massacre of people coming from explosives, chemical warfare, and other sophisticated lethal means. So uh, when this happens, all right, and the, the state is itself shocked because it hesitated, all right, it doubted. Can the Republic of the Philippines the state of the Republic of the Philippines uh, spend the rest of its life regretting why it ever doubted and allowed the massacre to happen. Your, yes. Honor, Your Honor, I think what could be done and what should be done is for our intelligence agencies to, to do the hard work. But it does not mean that the, our government should resort to shortcuts and the violations of constitutional rights. That is what we're but saying. But even with the, with the most sophisticated intelligence, of course, we don't have that here. Uh, uh, the intel, intel gathering, perhaps we have not reached that point of uh, utmost sophistication. There is always that possibility that the, the state will err. But it's better to err on the side of caution than play with fire. Because with fire, we might burn. Let me just say, Your Honor, that all of us petitioners believe that fighting terrorism is a noble cause. 
and we believe that we should fight against terrorism. Our problem, Your Honor, is in, in the fight against terrorism, our government has chosen to pass a law that violates constitutional rights and also its international human rights obligations. That's our problem, Your Honor. Right. There are other ways of fighting against terrorism. All right. But the, how to fight terrorism is a political question. It is not you, not me, not this court, which will decide the means by which to fight terrorism. It belongs to Congress and to the president who are the duly elected representatives of the people, subject, of course, to certain requirements. All right. So uh, do you have statistics so far on the number, statistics, how many bombings have we had since 1971 to, 19, uh, to 2019? No, Your Honor. Do you have? No, Your Honor. Okay, I'll give it to you. It's 78. From 1971 to 1991. The, those that have been reported and are known. All right? And thousands of lost lives. And thousands of injured. Okay, so where there is a clash between one's right to unrestrained liberty on one hand, and the right of the general public to safety and protection on the other, which one should be prioritized by the state? Your Honor, with due respect, Your Honor, we do not believe that this is a case of unrestrained liberty in conflict with the interest of the state. No, I, am, I have not uh, reached that point yet. Uh, my question is, uh, th there are no facts yet. Yes, Your Honor. Question. Sorry, it's Your Honor. It's just a pain question between choosing, the state choosing between one's right to unrestrained liberty on one hand and the right of the general public to safety and protection on the other. Which one should be prioritized by the state? Definitely, Your Honor, the right of the general public yes, to safety and security. Yes, and in the security. exercise of that right, okay, or power for that matter, what does the state exercise? Your Honor, police power, Your Honor. Yes. That is inherent. Yes, Your that Honor. That does not even have to be granted by the Constitution. Yes, Because Your Honor. it is the core of our existence. Yes, Your Honor. As uh, the state. All right. Now, the police power contemplates a situation where the compelling interests of the public in general, as distinguished from those of a particular class, requires interference. Yes, you Right, are. Professor? Yeah. All right. And so the quelling of terrorism and the punishment of terrorists are compelling and legitimate interests of the public in general. Yes, Professor? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. To serve this end, this end rather, the means employed should be reasonably necessary to yes. attain the objective sought and not to be unduly offensive upon individuals. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, since this is a question of wisdom, there is only one repository of the power to choose the means to be employed, and that is the political comprising of or consisting of the Congress and the, the President. All right. Now, let's balance the conflicting rights of the suspected terrorist on one hand and the general public on the other. When a suspected terrorist is detained for 10 days and later or even up to 24 days and later turns out to be innocent. What jeopardy is caused that person by the state? Your Honor, the person has already been harmed. Uh, there was already deprivation of liberty. There was, um, there was already damage to reputation. 
uh, the assets have been frozen. Yes. But that person story. remains alive, kicking, and in one piece. Well, yes, yes, Your Honor, but we cannot say that the harm uh, was benign or it was a minor harm that was it's caused. It's not a minor harm. Not at all, But Your what Honor. can be greater than losing one's life? All right. If upon the lapse of 10 days or 24 days of detention, the suspect is proven to be innocent, he is set free. He will still be very much alive and still in one piece. He can pursue actions provided by law, like a suit for damages under Article 32 of the Civil Code. The ATL also prescribes sanctions against erring law enforcers and military personnel. Do you have the, the listing of those sanctions that may be imposed uh, on erring uh, uh, law enforcement uh, members or members of the military under the civil code you under the atl under the atl yes, itself. Your honor. do you have uh, i don't have a list your honor but you there know, are provisions I, I want to hand you this list but i might be uh, i might be violating protocol so there are there is a listing like one uh, section 20 custody of intercepted and recorded communications, uh, any person who removes, deletes, expunges this communication, imprisonment 10 years, unauthorized or malicious interceptions and or recordings 10 years, unauthorized or malicious interceptions and or recordings 10 years, detention without judicial warrant of arrest 10 years, violation of rights of a detainee 10 years, Official custodial logbook and its contents, failure to keep it, 10 years. Malicious examination of a bank or a financial institution, 4 years. All right, now let's come to the rights of a detention officer or a detained suspect. Do you have a listing of their rights under the ATL? I have not made a list, Your Honor, but we're aware of the provisions in the ATA where um, seemingly there are... There are um, safeguards yes like uh, the right to counsel yes the right honor. to visitation the right to remain silent among others the right against torture or infliction of injuries yes these honor. are the rights of yes, a detention uh, of a detained suspect all right let me go to the next uh, all right so on the other hand, no, on the other end of the balance is public safety and security, the people's lives. If a suspected terrorist is released because the law enforcer is not fully convinced that he is a terrorist, but it turns out he is in fact a terrorist, but because he is not detained, he and his co-conspirators are able to bomb several hospitals and churches in the country, causing hundreds of lives to perish. How do you think the state can ever restore the lost lives of our people? Can we resurrect dead people here on earth? No, Your Honor. All right. So... The ATL implementation is one of the most, if not the most fragile or delicate and risky tasks of our law enforcers. Time here is always of the essence. One misstep, one missed moment, one error of judgment, one moment of delay, one moment of hesitation, one moment of reluctance, one moment of doubt, one moment of indecision, of cowardice or fear on the part of our law enforcers can instantly mean the loss of multitudes of lives of men, women, children, the old, the young, and even those still inside the wombs of their mother. That's why we have to balance. And balancing does not mean exactitude or robotic response, for there is no fixed formula for that. The state acts on a case-to-case -case 
basis. May I thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Your Honor. For your kind indulgence. Uh, may I call on Dean Jokno, please? Good afternoon, Dean. Good afternoon, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dean, uh, before the revised penal code, we had the old penal code, and 125 had a counterpart in the old penal code, and that was Article 202. Uh, are you aware of that? That would seem to be the, my recollection. Yeah. Yes, Article 202. Uh, could you recall how many, or the length of time, the duration uh, by which uh, a law enforcer should be able to deliver to the court, to the authorities, okay, the detained or arrested person without warrant. I don't recall the exact time. Yeah, I will recall it for you. It's only 24 hours after his arrest, as soon as possible. All right. Uh, would you know when the old penal code <laughs> took effect? Prior to the revised penal code, Your Honor. I think that is a safe answer. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm clarifying the question. Yes, Your Honor. because uh, I also don't know. I cannot find it in the books. The effectivity of uh, the old penal code. I believe that is sometime in the 1880s. Uh, no, I think in 1930, uh, Chief Justice, uh, the, the new P revised penal code. Chief revised penal code, it, did it take effect 1930? 32. Okay, yes, whatever, yes. So, uh, 1932. You were not yet born, I suppose. No, Your Honor. Neither was I. All, all of us were not yet born. All right. So, uh, the original iteration no, of uh, 125 under the revised penal code shortened the period to only one hour. Can you believe that? Believe it. From 24 hours to one hour. All right. But in 1932, art also, Article 125 was amended by Act 3940, extending the period to six hours. Okay, so back from 24 hours to one hour to six hours. All right, then in 1954, under RA 1083, when Congress prescribed a schedule of detention periods depending on the severity and gravity of the felony or offense. The rationale for the graduated schedule is born in the congressional record. Would you know the rationale uh, for the uh, graduated schedule? I cannot recall the rationale yes. for that particular amendment, Your Honor. So uh, the R8-1083, the records uh, for the rationale, the reason why these extensions were granted. According to Congress, these extensions, it is believed, are justified by past experience. It has been observed that the period of six hours indiscriminately applied to all cases is inadequate for the purposes of study and of filing the corresponding complaint or information for serious offenses. Hence, it has been thought advisable to make the periods allowable detention increase with the gravity of the offense. The proposed extension would work a great stride in the proper prosecution of malefactors for the public prosecutors will be given more time within which to properly study and prepare the complaints or information to be filed by them. And such proper study and preparation will in turn do away with unjust complaints, 
which are so hurriedly filed if only to comply with the six-hour period provided under the present law. That was the rationale. So from in 1954, there was already a graduated, uh, graduated period from six hours to nine hours to 18 hours, which the president, President Marcos under PD 1404, extended up to 30 days for crimes against national security and public order. But when President Corey took over, she repealed that PD via her Executive Order 59. And in 1987, she issued EO272 to amend Article 125, the present iteration, 12 hours. 18 hours and 36 hours okay and the extended period of detention may be justified first the gravity of the offense second the time it takes to study the case for purposes of filing the corresponding complaint or do away with unjust complaints which are so hurriedly filed all right so then then uh, would you agree that our laws, even the, the present iteration no, of uh, 125, had also evolved, had also evolved to cope up with the present times, with the changing times, and also to reflect our experiences where the previous uh, periods would no longer be practical and uh, of use to our Different, uh, different or varying needs. It would appear from your honest narration yes. that the, it has evolved due to the to avoid unjust complaints. All right. So we also we, we continue. So one two five actually is a work in progress. Don't you think so? Do you think that uh, work Article one two five in its present iteration will just stay like that forever? Well, as far as the present situation is concerned, I don't see any reason why yes, but, uh, that particular uh, law should be see, amended. We right? cannot see and we cannot foretell what situation would uh, actually warrant all right, a, an amendment of this uh, law because it's only Congress that will determine that. Because, yes, yes. and the law is, is not sacrosanct. Just like any other law, it may yes, be amended. Yes, it Your can Honor. be repealed, it can be amended, etc. It's all right. So, ATM, when it comes to detention up to 24 days, is an amendment no, or Honor, a modification? My understanding of the anti terror law, it does not amend Article 125, it simply states that because it does not. Life. Yes, it doesn't apply because uh, it has uh, Congress has opted to classify uh, terrorism as a sui generis. Well, our, our problem, if I may, Your Honor, with respect to that 14 and 24 day detention in Section 29 of the Anti-Terror Law, is that according to the Senate deliberations, it was so that it was to give the government sufficient time to build a case. Build a How, case, however, collate evidence, yes, Your and Honor. even to prevent unjust prosecution. However, Your Honor, Section 29 clearly refers to arrest without warrant. And we know that for a valid arrest without warrant, it must either be in hot pursuit or in flagrante delicto, in which case the evidence is already very strong because the crime happened right in front of the arresting offices or had just occurred. And therefore, there would be no need for a 14 or 24 hour day period to build the case because by the mere fact of arresting them in the act, yeah. the evidence is more than enough but to But you know, uh, not everyone that is uh, arrested in flagrante delicto is convicted. And not everyone who is caught in flagrante delicto is actually charged. Well, the and uh, we can we can actually 
attribute that to the periods given to our prosecutors or our, oh, not the prosecutors, to our law enforcers uh, who will also process the evidence on their hand. I would respectfully beg to disagree, Your Honor. Perhaps those, those, there were no convictions because the witnesses did not appear or there were other circumstances that uh, prevented the, the conviction. But as far as the in flagrante evidence is concerned, it's already there. The arresting officers saw the crime occur in front of them, and therefore there's really no other evidence to gather as far when, as... When the law enforcer says that I caught him in flagrante delicto. Are you going to believe that instantly? You still go by the evidence. Maybe in, from the point of view of that uh, law enforcer, oh, he is in, committing it in flagrante delicto. Huh? But uh, the prosecutor sees otherwise. The judge sees otherwise. So it is not the say-so of the law enforcer. When the law enforcer says, this is it, that is, that is it. Of course that doesn't honor, work you. that way. Of course, Your Honor. The All right. Would, uh, because, you know, uh, on the ground, the law enforcer has to exercise some kind of judgment call right there and then and err on the side of caution than play with fire and burn. So, thank I, you. Would you like something well, else? So, I would not uh, like uh, yes, you can. You that. can actually. Uh, you can. You can actually discuss further in your memorandum. Thank, thank you, you very much, Steve. Thank you. All right, Chips and Dali. <laughs> Last, uh, Professor Molo. I have five minutes, Chief. Uh, Professor Molo. Good afternoon, Justice. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Professor. Good afternoon, Justice. Uh, material support, it is your view that the, the definition uh, under the ATL of material support is vague. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, material, can, can you read the definition? material support your honor providing material support to terrorists any person who provides material support to any terrorist individual or terrorist organization association or group of persons committing any of the acts punishable under section 4 hereof knowing that such individual or organization association or group of persons is committing or planning to... material support are oh, we sorry. on the same page Yes, material uh, yes. support. You said yeah. it is your view that uh, material support as uh, defined by law is uh, vague? Uh, yes, Your yes. Honor. That's our uh, submission. Uh, excuse me, Chief, Chief Justice. Excuse me. Uh, I don't think I will be able to finish even one question for Attorney Mono. Chief, with your indulgence, may I just continue next? session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justice. Is the National Security Advisor here? Okay. okay. Sorry, we are not able to acknowledge you earlier. Just put on record that the National Security Advisor is present. General uh, Hermes is Peron, Secretary is Peron. Now, uh, because it's already 5.30 in the afternoon, so we might as well continue next Tuesday. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Congressman. Just, Mr. Chief Justice and Your Honors, before we adjourn this afternoon's session, can I make a very brief manifestation? Go ahead, Congressman. <clears throat> Your Honors, for the first time in history, petitioners and their counsel before this honorable court 
are seriously threatened with prosecution under the challenge statute by no less than a military general who is part of the state enforcing the controverted APA. Also, for the first time, Your Honors, a petitioner before this honorable court, Chad Boca, in a GR number 252904, has been taken into custody by police enforcers from the SBD retreat house at the University of San Carlos yesterday. All of this would underscore the chilling effect of the ATA, which uh, caused citizens into silence and are restrained or precluded from exercising their freedom of expression. Your Honors, the ATA is presumed unconstitutional because it is challenged as a statute infringing on free speech and other fundamental freedoms. And uh, this is the ruling in uh, SWS versus Comelec, David versus Arroyo, and Bayan versus Ermita, among others. Consequently, and finally, Your Honors, because of this occurrence of these ominous events, and because ATAs, ATA is presumed to be unconstitutional, wherein the state would come before this court with the heavy burden of uh, proving otherwise we respectfully pray and reiterate our plea for the issuance of injunctive relief in these cases. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, it's, it's not merely a manifestation. You're, you're praying for the issuance of a temporary restraining order. Consequent my manifestation, Your Honor. No, okay, anyway, so you are reiterating. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. We'll tackle that uh, next, uh, next, next Tuesday. I'll consult with the ponente. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you are if you are moving for the issuance of DRO, then we will request the or order the Office of the Civil Store General to file its uh, its comment before we resolve the motion, Congressman. That will be all right. Yes, Your Honor, we are just reiterating what we have previously paid for and uh, the uh, joint uh, motion of the petitioners for the issuance of PRO. I don't know whether on record the Solicitor General has already answered that motion. Yeah. There, there's a pending motion that you filed. Uh, before, but we did not own that. So that means that we we denied it because there was no resolution. But you are alleging other uh, other matters now. There are, are supervening circumstances. Yes, yeah, supervening. So may you know, so that the office of the civil store general will be also will properly assess of the allegations in your application for TRO. May I may we just request that you put it in writing? Yes, you're right. And then uh, we will after the receipt of the, your prayer for the Shion of the TRO, then we will require the OSB to submit its comment. And thereafter, we will consider the motion submitted for resolution. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so please please do it. We will, okay. Your Honor. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honor. Anyway, anyway, uh, we just file a formal motion, no? formal application, and then indicate 
delegations in the uh, you, you indicate your reasons rather or state in your reasons and then copy furnish the office of the solicitor general what uh, yes that will be all right yeah, chief may i suggest that the movement uh, be given a period of 48 hours to file the corresponding pleading uh, for, and then for that pleading to be personally served to the soldier who shall be given the same period of time or at least until Monday noon time to file a comment so that by Tuesday the court will be able to tackle the matter. Thank you. Do you, do you any motion from the solicitor? <laughs> yes, we will just wait for the end. Um, motion. Your honors. Will you please uh, remove time because we will Mr. Have solicitor to... General, can you please uh, remove okay. your honor, okay, so that we can hear you. May we ask for uh, sufficient time for us, your honors, so that we can uh, talk with our clients. Because I believe this is not in Metro Manila. Uh, it is in Cebu. So it will take us some time, in your honors, that we can go deeply what happened, really. Ten, ten days will not be sufficient. Ten days, your honor? Yeah, from receipt of the motion of what, Congressman Lagman. Uh, it will be okay, but if... We, we still need some more uh, days, then we will uh, file a motion to that effect, Your Honor. You might ask for additional 30 days. <laughs> no. Well, we would li we like that, Your Honor. If you will, okay, uh, okay, 10 days to now. Okay. So, the petitioners uh, through uh, Congressman Laguan will file a formal a formal motion and then a copy furnish the office of the Solicitor General. And the Solicitor General is ordered to file its uh, comment or objection to the motion. Thereafter, we'll resolve the motion. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, we will be filing a joint motion. Also, oh, but uh, I understand from uh, the other counsel that most probably more than 48 hours may be needed by uh, the petitioners yes. okay could we request for a little it's, it's up to you it's, time? it's up to you that's your that's your work it's up to you okay Is it okay okay thank so, you thank you so due to uh, lack of material time being already 5 30 in the afternoon and the and the justices have still questions to ask on the petitioners counsel the uh, session, the hearing is hereby suspended and resumed on February 26th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Paragraph as prayed for by the Petitioner's Council. They are, here, they are hereby ordered to file the formal, formal motion or petition for the issuance of a temporary restoring order or preliminary injunction, furnishing copy thereof the Office of the Citizens or General, and the latter is hereby given 10 days from receipt of the motion or petition within which to submit its comment or objection thereafter the motion and the corresponding comment or objection shall be submitted for resolution so order so that will be okay okay she did. so next hearing is february 23 oh, yeah, i'm sorry huh? it should be february 23 at two o'clock in the afternoon yeah, 23 not, not 26, sorry, so February 23. So there are being no other matters to be taken up in this afternoon session. The session is here by adjourned.